I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified uh, District uh, School District Board of Education to order. There is one closed session item in tonight's agenda. It is the student suspensions in four cases, according to Education Code Section 48918 sub F. Ms. Rye, will, will you please give the instructions to those in attendance via Zoom on how they can raise their hand if they have a comment on closed session agenda items. And certainly Dr. McKibben, let me share my screen here. If you'd like to offer a comment on a closed session item and have joined us on the Zoom call, now would be your opportunity to raise your hand. To do so, click the raise hand button found at the bottom of your screen on a mobile device, the bottom of the participant list on a desktop Zoom client, or by pressing star nine if you dialed into tonight's board meeting. Okay, uh, Ms. Ms. Rye, do we have any public comment for the closed session agenda items? I am not seeing raised hands for public comment for closed session. Okay, we'll wait a couple of seconds. We, we will now move into closed session and we'll return to open session at 6.30. I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified uh, School District Board of Education back to order. This meeting is being audio and video recorded and the recording may capture sounds and images of those attending the meeting. The recording uh, will be posted on the district website. In compliance with order, the order issued by the Sacramento County Health Officer on July 6, 2022, directing all public meetings in the county to occur virtually until further notice. This Board of Education meeting is being held telephonically. Staff and others presenting at the meeting are calling in via, via the Zoom video conferencing platform for, from separate locations. Please stand for the virtual presentation of the colors by the Casa Robley Fundamental High School Air Force Junior ROTC. Color guard, attention, hut, for, harms, forward, heart. Color guard, halt, ready, haste. Ready, haste, reason, harms. Ladies and gentlemen, may you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order, arms, ready, haste. Forward, heart. President McKibben, you're on mute. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I am Michael McKibben, board president. Joining me tonight is Ms. Zima Creason, board vice president, Ms. Pam Costa, board clerk, and Mr. Saul Hernandez and Ms. Paula Viasquez, board members. Superintendent Kent Kern and other staff members are also in attendance. Before we begin, I'd like to review the two methods that are available to submit public comment for tonight's meeting. First, the first option is to submit 
a written comment using the comment form located in the district website at www.sanjuan.edu backslash board meeting. If you wish to submit a written comment on more than one agenda item, please submit a separate form for each item on which you are commenting. Written comments are limited to 1500 characters. Comments will be provided uh, to the members of the board. The second option is on the form, uh, the Zoom platform, where you may use the raise your hand feature. When you are called on, you may share a comment via audio during the meeting. Please note that board bylaw 9323 limits visitor comments to two minutes per speaker with no more than 30 minutes per uh, single uh, topic. Time will be extended to any speaker who uses an interpreter. Please be aware that public comments, including your name, become a part of the public record. Alternatively, the meeting may be also may be also may be viewed uh, on the district's YouTube channel where it is being live streamed. We now move to item D. The approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? So moved. I, is there a second? I, I, there are no corrections uh, and Mr. Hernandez has moved the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Creason. All those in, uh, uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? I'd like to abstain due to my absence at the meeting. Okay. The motion passes four to zero with one abstention. We move to item E, uh, which is uh, our recognitions. Tonight, we have two recognitions. The first recognition is for the National School Social Work Week, Dr. Calvin. Good evening, President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. The superintendent is recommending that the board adopt resolution number A410, proclaiming the week of March 6th through March 12th as National School Social Work Week. Here to accept the resolution is Support Center Social Worker Erica Navarro and the Director of Multi-Tiered System of Supports, Christine Moran. Good evening. It is my honor to introduce our lead, acting lead social worker, Erica Navarro. Erica will be accepting this recognition on behalf of the district school social workers. Good evening. My name is Erica Navarro. I'm one of the school social workers with Student Support Centers. I'm incredibly honored to receive this recognition on behalf of the school social workers in the district who we plan to celebrate next month during National School Social Worker Week. Thank you to the members of the board, administrators, teachers, staff, students, caregivers, family and community members in attendance tonight. I want to express how incredibly grateful and honored we feel to have our work and profession recognized tonight. As school social workers, our goal is to support students' needs, act as their advocates, and be the bridge that links them to the services they need, as well as provide encouragement and praise for their accomplished goals. We know that the support and services we provide increases the opportunities for their academic success and positively impact the student achievement for San Juan students and families across the district. And although our schools and communities have faced several challenges in the last two years, we are thankful to work alongside amazing teachers and staff in whom we have found not only empathy, compassion, patience, and resilience, but also inspiration when we see the unwavering commitment of so many colleagues who also champion students' academic successes and social emotional well-being every day as much as we do. 
I sincerely want to thank our MTSS program director, Christine Moran, the Student Support Center, uh, Student Support Services Director, excuse me, Dominic Cavello, and Assistant Superintendent for Educational Services, Dr. Debra Calvin, for their continued support of our practice and also for bringing to the forefront the importance of meeting the needs of our students with a whole child lens and recognizing that the role of school social workers in supporting social emotional development and wellness is a crucial part of every child's academic success and educational experience. We believe the role of a school social worker is also instrumental and aligns with our district's mission by furthering efforts in providing a setting for teaching and learning where home, school, and community connections are key to achieving our students' success. Lastly, I'd like to thank the board and all of its members for offering, for offering this recognition to the school social workers in this district. We hope that the work that we do in our schools and communities can serve as an inspiration for those who work and engage with children in our district and celebrate with each child every goal that they accomplish. We will continue our efforts to remove barriers, encourage growth, and support the needs of our San Juan Unified students and families. And we look forward to making a positive impact for students, schools, and communities where we serve. On behalf of my colleagues, I am honored and humbled to receive this recognition. Thank you and good night. Okay. Uh, next, we would like to go to uh, board members' uh, comments and questions. And I'll begin uh, with Ms. Viasquez. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. And it's a, it's a pleasure to honor you. One thing I wanted to kind of pull out from the resolution quickly, because it just really stood out to me, was um, the last whereas clause, school social workers help students overcome the difficulties in their lives and as a result, give them a better chance to reach their full academic and personal potential. Um, what a tremendous calling. Thank you for doing that work. Um, and in recognition of that, both in, in addition to resolutions such as the one we are reviewing this evening, I just wanna also point out because I, I do track this closely in my other hat that I wear professionally, but um, the state has also recognized the significant contribution with um, really unprecedented investments in the governor's budget this year of almost $300 million to support the field. So I'm excited about what that means for all of us in our community because of the wonderful contributions you all make every day. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, uh, Mr. Hernandez, please. I just wanna thank you for the report and appreciate all the work that you and your colleagues do. You're a vital piece of our family. So thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Costa. Thank you so very much. Uh, you are making such a difference in schools with our students and with our staffs and it is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Ms. Creason. I wanna echo just my thanks and it's an honor to have the opportunity to honor you and all you do and the title of social worker. I don't think the majority of folks understand the role and responsibilities and the breadth of services that title comes with um, and I do. So just thank you so much for all you do. Um, couldn't do it without you. Again, uh, I wanna echo, the, the, thank you very much uh, to the, uh, fr from the board to the social workers for their unwavering support of our students, particularly with their social emotional needs and this time uh, that unprecedented time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Calvin, Ms. Navarro and Ms. Moran uh, uh, for doing this. Uh, is there a motion to, uh, to adopt uh, resolution uh, A410 proclaiming March 6th through 12th as National Social School Social Work Week. So moved. Moved by Ms. Viasquez. Second. Second by Ms. Creason. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, it is unanimous. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Calvin, Ms. Uh, Ms. Navarro, and Ms. Moran. We move to our second recognition now for Arts Education Month uh, Ms. Townsend Snyder. 
Good evening, Board President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. It's really great to be with you again this evening um, in celebration of this wonderful recognition. We're very excited to share with you this evening. Our superintendent is recommending that the board adopt resolution number A411, recognizing the month of March as Arts Education Month. With me tonight is Program Specialist Gary Courtney, who I will now pass the presentation to, to share with you all of the wonderful things happening in his division. Thank you, Amber Lee. Members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham, thank you for the opportunity to come before you this evening in acknowledgement and celebration of the arts. Every year in March, we honor the efforts and dedication of our arts practitioners and celebrate the joy and excitement of learning that our students experience through the arts. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge our incredible teacher leaders that are the heart and soul of our department. Michael Dittmer, K-12 Visual and Media Arts, Sarah Brown, Elementary Music, Sonia Takanikos, Secondary Music, and Denny Schofield, Secondary Drama and Theater. As always, I want to thank Amberly and Michael for their collaboration and support in the preparation of this presentation. During this time of challenges and opportunity in education, the arts continue to be a critical source of experiential learning that keeps our students engaged in school, supports our students' social, emotional, and other trauma-based needs, as well as being an effective means for empowering voice and engaging in dialogue on issues of social justice and educational equity. As always, San Juan remains committed to the belief that every child deserves a complete and competitive education, which includes learning in and through the arts. We believe that arts experiences are a key component in improving students' learning, wellness, and life balance. Every year, it is our commitment and goal to offer a robust, sequential, and comprehensive K-12 arts education. This includes the five arts disciplines of visual art, media, music, dance, and theater. I want to emphasize that we are one of the only districts in the region committed to elementary arts education taught by content specialists that strives to ensure that every student has the opportunity to participate in the arts. This year, we have seen increased opportunity and participation in the arts in all forms and at all levels. We continue to provide arts experiences to all students in the district and have more than 25,000 students participating in our various programs. It has been wonderful to see the arts return to our schools and to watch students and teachers re-engage in the arts in our classrooms, multi-purpose rooms, galleries, and theaters. I want to commend the incredible educators for um, our, uh, excuse me, I want to commend our incredible educators for keeping our children safe as they participate in the arts and in continuing to be creative in developing effective teaching techniques to support arts learning during these unique times in education. While some of our larger district events are still remain a challenge, I am pleased to announce that there have been many concerts, art galleries, dance and drama productions so far this year with many more to come. We want to give special recognition to the music students at Churchill Middle School for auditioning and being selected to the California Allstate Middle School Honor Band. From left to right, eighth grader Charlotte Cantor on French horn, eighth grader Ryan Nordahl, euphonium, seventh grader Gabriel Huang on clarinet, and seventh grader Amberlyn Liu, alto saxophone. Congratulations to all of them for receiving such a special honor. We look forward to the rest of the 21-22 school year and the opportunity for students, parents, and the community to come together in celebration of performances and presentations. We hope that you will come out and support our wonderful arts programs at the next school concert, production, or gallery. We also invite you to attend our many district events throughout the remainder of our school year. Finally, we have created a video highlighting works of art and arts learning in the classroom that de demonstrates the spirit of our students and the dedication of our teachers. At the end of the video, we spotlight our new music program at Dyer Kelly and asked a few of the students, how are they enjoying the program?
are at Kingswood Elementary practicing baby shark. because we learn new notes and it's really fun to sing our friends names and I like really to play the flute and it is fun to do it guitar music and band we have to, I like to do it but with sings game and it is good I love music and Dyer Kelly because you get to sing a lot of songs and you get to see the instruments I like music in Dyer Kelly because I can sing songs with my music teacher and I can play band with my trombone. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to come before this evening. I pass it back to you, Board President McKibben. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do any of the board members have comments? I'll start with uh, um, Ms. Fiasquez. Just to say thank you and great job representing your colleagues. Um, I'm excited to also um, get this kind of spring performing arts season up and running. I'm planning to attend the Oklahoma performance over at El Camino, but I'm gonna keep an eye out for other opportunities. Um, but thank you for the, the presentation and for everything that you do. Mr. Hernandez. Just love the report, especially love the video. And please remind those great performers to continue to invite us so we can attend those uh, activities. Because we, if we're invited, we do try to make it. So please remind them to invite us. Thank you very much. Okay. Ms. Costa. Thank you so much for the report. The video was fantastic. And thank you to all of our teachers across the district at all levels who provide such an outstanding program. And I just want to say publicly, San Juan District was the only district that in the tightest of financial times continued to fund the arts because it has been a focus of our district throughout time. And we made other cuts so that the arts could continue in San Juan. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed that presentation and I was able to quickly get my son to bring one of his art pieces <laughs> that he did. I know you can't really see that great because of the background, but it's the Mask of Majora from Zelda. And it's something that we're all very proud of in this house. And, you know, just appreciation to, you know, everyone that makes the programs happen to the teachers and the culture of art appreciation that is a part, it just really embedded in our district. You know, we have parents that come in as docents. My son is a piano player now and really got his first taste of that through a docent, a parent that was coming in playing piano at his elementary school. It's a big deal. Art is a huge piece of the whole child. And as was mentioned, social, emo social emotional support in a way to, um, it's a therapeutic, it's a therapeutic tool. It really is throughout adulthood. So just so appreciative and thanks for all you do. And, and again, I add my thanks and, and also second what Mr. Hernandez says, please make sure that we know about the uh, dates for the various act activities like kids art and others, because we do love to come out and see those kinds of things. Thank you uh, again, once again, thank you. Is there a motion to adopt resolution A411 proclaiming the month of March as Arts Education Month? So moved. Second. That was moved by Ms. Costa, seconded by Mr. Hen Hernandez. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, that, that is unanimous. Again, thank you, Ms. Townsend Snyder and Mr. Courtney for this great presentation. Uh, and, uh, and thank indeed all of the people and students uh, along with that. We now move to uh, high school student council reports. Tonight, we will hear from the representatives from El Camino Fundamental High School and Encina Preparatory High School. Welcome and let's begin with Nayeli uh, Reyes uh, Guerrero from El Camino High School. I hope I got that right, uh, uh, Nayeli. Hi, good evening, President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. My name is Nayeli Reyes and I'm the ASB Vice President at El Camino Fundamental High School. 
I'm super excited to speak on behalf of my school today about what's been happening here at El Camino. Our senior student government class has been hard at work organizing a COVID safe senior ball. They are working hard to keep senior traditions going during these difficult times. Juniors have been working hard on fundraising and planning for our junior prom. All of classes have been working hard hosting fundraisers for their class and showing off their school spirit. This week, sophomores are selling lollipops for a dollar and last week freshmen sold Valentine grams in the quad. This week, we are hosting a Spirit Week and two lunchtime rallies to show our love for our students uh, and to spread some Valentine spirit as well as, de as decorating our hallways. On February 2nd, we had our second club rush of the year. Kids from all over the school gathered together in the quad to join clubs that have been created by other students such as the Civics Club, Newspaper Club, and the Screaming Eagles. Club Rush has always been a great event to encourage getting our students more involved on campus. It allows them to try new things and find new interests and friends. Our drama class has been hard at work preparing for their Oklahoma musical on March 10th to the 12th. They are having a total of four shows and for those unable to attend, the play will be live streamed. On Saturday, the choir had their annual cabaret, which is an annual fundraiser for the program. They're also hoping to start preparing to have a spring festival. Band is participating in the musical coming up in early March in collaboration with choir and drama. They will be holding the 24th annual Young Musicians Band Clinic also in March. The date is still to be determined. We have a band spring concert planned for March 25th and our annual evening of jazz fundraising concert is scheduled for April 30th. As for our EPI program, which is a sophomore senior program where students are developing skills to prepare for majors such as architecture, manufacturing, engineering, and more, Seniors in the pre-engineering program are working on human-powered vehicles using advanced welding. Juniors are working on making a 3D AutoCAD, which is where they make 3D objects using a digital app. And sophomores are using siege machines to build mini bridges. Our new medical assisting program, a junior and senior program, having their first class graduating from the program this year. At the moment, the goal is to prepare seniors for the test certification in May. Students are practicing medical protocols on site and seniors in the program are expected to get their CPR certification sometime in March. Another CTE program El Camino has is media, which is all about connecting the campus with community through project-based learning. One way we do this is with our very own student-led radio station, which can be listened to at KYDS 91.5 FM. Another way is through our school newspaper in which students are actively posting news stories at ECHSnews.com with updates about things occurring on our campus. Our school spreads our Eagle spirit through our Screaming Eagles, also known as our student section. With spring sports just starting, students are so excited to be able to cheer on our Eagles. Just as last Friday, our Screaming Eagles uh, went to the El Camino versus Rio Boys varsity basketball game in which El Camino won 70 to 48 against our school rivals and earned a spot in the playoffs. As for upcoming events, student government is hoping to hold a Mardi Gras dance and we are hard at work planning the powder puff game where juniors and seniors play a friendly game of flag football. El Camino has been doing well. We are full of Eagle pride and spirit and are so happy to be back in school. I would love to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nayeli. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, do you have any comments or questions? I just appreciate the report. It sounds like you guys are very busy at El Camino and congratulate you for all that you do to bring everybody involved at your school. It sounds like you are quite, you guys do that very well. So thank you for that Eagles pride. We appreciate it. Okay. Uh, next is me, uh, Ms. Fiasquez. Okay, well, I was gonna pass, but if you're gonna- uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, well, I, I got out of order. That's okay. Um, since you've got to, got to have to take a significant pause, I will just say thank you very much. Um, I, um, I'm really excited to hear about all the wonderful things happening there. Love the report out on the CTE. I was trying to keep it short, but if y'all are gonna make me talk, I'll keep it <laughs> um, So thank you very much. It was really great to hear your report. Miss Costa. My thanks as well. And you really proved that the arts are alive in the San Juan district and especially at El Camino. Thanks for that. And Ms. Creason. 
Thanks so much for the report. I'm really looking forward to attending Oklahoma. I went to Mama Mia a couple of years ago, changed my life, never saw it before. So I'm really excited to be my life to be changed again when I go see Oklahoma, which I've never seen before. And my husband's from there. So don't tell him that. Um, and I also want to note your basketball team beat Christian Brothers terribly, which is my old stomping ground. So go Eagles. And just thank you so much for your report. Okay. And I did have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one was, what are the dates uh, for uh, Oklahoma? Uh, uh, which dates are, is it going to be, be presented? Uh, is my first question. I believe it is March 10th to the 12th. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. And the second one is you mentioned the medic, medical assisting program. If there's any kind of uh, special, excuse me, <clears throat> recognition or culmination for that program, since it's uh, relatively new, uh, uh, we'd love to hear when that is going to happen too. Okay. Um, you probably don't know that, but please send it to us. Okay. I will. All right. Um, thank you very much. Now we move to uh, Encina and uh, we, we hear from Mel Sombang and Justin Orozco Ramirez uh, from uh, Encina. Mel and Justin, uh, are you ready? Yes, yes, we are ready. All right. Well, good evening, President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. I'm Justin Orozco Ramirez, ASP Vice President. And I am Mel Songvang, ASP President. Thank you for inviting us to share the latest information about Encina Preparatory High School. This year continues to be challenging and planning activities following the latest county guidances to keep our students safe from COVID. Our student, our student government class has been flexible in planning, changing, and rescheduling events. We held our annual fall festival where we had games, music, prizes, and even um, fundraising opportunities. Unfortunately, we're not able to hold the Thanksgiving Fest, the Thanksgiving Feast portion of Point West Rotary. We're eager to try again in the spring, community support, something bigger for Encina and our feeder schools and our multicultural fair in April. This continues needed. This continued needed. Our student government class put on a book and clothing giveaway in December. We organized clothes closet and brought in unused books to create a giveaway for families. We invited our students, families from our feeder schools to come and at least 30 families attend. Our goal to put on is another giveaway in spring and hopefully it won't rain and more families can attend. <laughs> our spring planning continues as we prepare for sports Rama on March 11th, multicultural night on April 29th, continue link crew events, lunchtime activities, and the return of dances, including our junior and senior prom on uh, April 23rd. Winter sports are coming to an end. Our boys soccer team had a great season. They secured first place and even went to section playoffs. Our Lady Bulldog soccer season went better than expected. They furnished fifth out of eight teams for the first time in 10 years. We also had a JV boys, varsity girls, and varsity boys basketball team. And they had a great job working together, practicing hard and keeping their grades up and following not my bad, and growing as great athletes this season. Our sports, yeah, and our new sports are coming right around the corner with basketball, track and field and tennis and hopefully a softball team. A team of administrators, teachers, counselors and students have been working with equal opportunity schools to increase equal opportunities for our students in advanced courses. Recently, students took a survey to find out find out about their interest in taking AP courses while staff was surveyed to see how they can support and gain interest from students in taking more rigorous courses. As Encina prepares to do course requests in Navi on to their counselors in March, this equity team is working to target students for AP classes and use the data to identify and support those students in academic opportunities and success. AP classes at all levels in social science are seeing an increase in enrollment and we're retaining a higher percentage in students. The benefits of offering AP classes at lower grade levels, starting with AP World and 10th, is beginning to pay off. This allows us to capture academically motivated students at a younger age, keeping them engaged and challenged in their courses and preparing them for the requirements of future courses. The students now come into AP better prepared for the level of work required and to move at the pace and rigor necessary to prepare them for the AP exam. We have 16 students who are dual enrolled with American River College this semester. Sophomores and seniors have taken courses from the Human Career Development Department. 
The courses focus on skills and learning about how to be successful in a college class. Upon successful completion, students will receive three college units that are UC to CSU compatible. And the sophomores will receive three community college units. They will also all receive 10 high school elective credits for this course. Our visual and performing arts department collaborated with students to select designs for a mural for our campus. Students were asked to create artwork that they felt was a representation of our school community. The mural is funded from grants written by Latinx activists and our own teacher, Ruby Chacon, will be the lead artist and she is a mural artist in our community. She has also created a new course this year, next year, called Mural Design for our advanced art students. Students will also have the opportunity to request choir and band for next year, in addition to our existing choices, which include drama, art, digital arts, and modern dance. New this year, we are offering an introduction to media arts, which produces our weekly Bulldog News Bulletin. We are also currently offering a guitar class after school. And our drumline program is hard at work and recently performed at our senior night for basketball. Our independent living skills class is having a great year. They continue to use board adopted unique learning system slash news to you core curriculum, supplemented by teacher designed curricula and activities. Examples include a banking money management class and maintaining their class vegetable garden. The biggest news this year is that they have a kitchen. Um, with site, district, and community support, the kitchen is equipped with a range, full-size refrigerator, and several small appliances. Students now have hands-on experiences as they learn about nutrition, recipes, meal planning, food safety, and food prep. Hands-on experiences, <laughs> planning and executing their weekly cooking projects is a highlight for students. For example, last week they made homework tortillas. After a year of on-campus only instruction, the ILS program is gradually re-implementing a rigorous community-based program. Our seniors all participate in paid off-campus workability jobs on PetSmart and Smart and Final. And our younger students participate in community-based instructional activities such as grocery shopping. And so on behalf of Encina Preparatory High School, we'd like to thank the board for this opportunity to update you on our school. We'd also like to invite you to visit our campus or attend any of our events and activities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mel, Mel and Justin. Uh, board members, uh, uh, Ms. Vasquez. Thank you for, for the report. Lots of really exciting things happening there. Excited to hear about all of the different um, wide range of sports. And also I'm gonna totally come crash Ms. Chacon's class on mural planning because that sounds awesome. And I can't wait to see that <laughs> get off the ground and up and running. Thank you for the report and all that you do. Okay. Mr. Hernandez. Just thank you for the report. Sounds like you guys are very busy at Encina as well, and uh, that's great to see. So thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Costa. I'd just like to add my thanks as well. You are so busy, and it sounds exciting, and I really want to come see your new mural. Thanks. And uh, Ms. Creason. So first and foremost, I want to come get a plate. You guys are kicking into our tortillas. <laughs> I put that straight at the top of my notes. Um, I was able to visit Encina several times um, in the last couple of years, but I haven't been back in quite some time. So I will be back to see you very, very soon. Congratulations on your soccer success. I um, have to do a plug for my family. Um, Davell Perry, who graduated maybe two years ago, is my nephew, who was one of your former soccer stars. So I'm so happy to hear that you guys are still going strong. And I really appreciate you speaking to your dual enrollment program. So again, for folks that maybe didn't catch that, that's where folks can get, young folks can get their high school credit along with college credit at the same time. And this programming has demonstrated tremendous outcomes throughout our nation. So thank you for speaking on that. And I'm glad that it's being implemented in your school. And also I had the opportunity to connect with Ruby and heard a lot about the mural. And I'm really excited that that's moving forward and I can't wait to see it. So just thanks for all that you do and you'll see me in your kitchen very soon. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to add my congratulations on the continued increases in the advanced course, courses uh, and so forth and in the in, uh, increases in enrollment. Uh, uh, thank you, Mel and Justin. And th thank you again, uh, uh, Niali. Uh, um, we would like to thank you for, for your reports and for being here tonight. Student voice is very important to us uh, on the board. We appreciate your being here. You're welcome to stay for the remainder of the meeting, 
but we realize that you have homework and busy lives. So if you need to attend to that, this is a good time to return to other things that, that need your attention. Again, thanks so much for these reports. We now move on to items uh, E3 through E6, and, and there are no reports from staff, board appointed uh, district committees, employee organizations, or, or district organizations. So we move to item E7 from closed session, expulsion cases, Ms. Costa. The board voted unanimously to accept a hearing panel's recommendations of three expulsions in case numbers M15, S35, and S36. The board also voted unanimously to accept a hearing panel's recommendation of one suspended expulsion in case number S37. Thank you very much. We now move to visitor comments. This is item F. Ms. Rye, will you please give instructions to those in attendance via Zoom on how to raise their hand if they have a comment at this time? Ms. Rye. Certainly, President McKibben. This item is an opportunity for those individuals attending today's meeting to offer comment on topics that are not on tonight's agenda. If your comment is related to an item on tonight's agenda, we would ask that you hold your comment until that item is called and public comment will be offered at that time. Please note that the board cannot respond to comments that are shared during this item. We know that many that have joined tonight may want to provide a comment about COVID-19 safety protocols, including face coverings. There will be a COVID-19 update tonight on the agenda under item I-4. If you do have a comment related to COVID-19 safety, including face coverings, please hold your comment until agenda item I-4 is called so that your comment can be a part of the board's conversation on that item. If you'd like to offer a comment on a topic that is not on tonight's agenda uh, and have joined us via the Zoom call, now would be your opportunity to raise your hand. And let me share my screen here. To do so, the raise hand button can be found at the bottom of your screen on a mobile device, the bottom of the participant list on a desktop Zoom client, or by pressing star nine if you dialed in to tonight's meeting. Okay, Ms. Wright, do we have any general visitor comments? We do have one raised hand, Dr. McKibben. Okay. Uh, I would like to remind the public that the comments are limited to two minutes. The clock on the screen counts down the time. Under the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not allowed to comment on items that are not on the agenda. So we are not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to any individual comments. The superintendent can refer items to staff who can follow up with you. Ms. Rye, would you please help facilitate the public comment? Of course. The first raised hand we have is from Katie Day. And Katie, whenever you are ready, please go ahead and unmute and provide your comment. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, an article came across my desk today. Um, I have two students in San Juan School District. I've spoken at many of your meetings and this has nothing to do with masking. This article is from a scientific journal um, and the title is Autops Autopsy Histopathologic Cardiac Findings in Two Adolescents Following the Second COVID-19 Vaccine Dose. I am letting you know that this article uh, exists because I want it on record that this board has been told that the conclusion of the latest science is saying that myocardial injury ha has been seen in these post-vaccine hearts from different, pe different children to, to people in this particular case, this science is absolutely coming out now, the same thing that we've been telling you from observation in the last six months of meetings. This board needs to know that you are absolutely complicit in possibly murdering our children in San Juan School District. We're not gonna tolerate it. We're not gonna take it. We will be taking our masks off. We will be taking our kids out of, out of your district. And you need to stand up 
for these children. The fact that you're celebrating the arts in this district and how much you are helping traumatized children while at the same time you are traumatizing these children with the masking is disgusting. Stand up San Juan School Board and stop this madness. I want these vaccine clinics ended. Thank you, Ms. Day. Uh, uh, Ms. Rye, do we have any other uh, visitor comments? We do have several raised hands. Next, we have Amy Saygraves. And Amy, whenever you are ready, please go ahead and unmute. Good evening. I'm calling with regards to the relocation of the Katherine Johnson um, Middle School students to the location of Creekside Park. Um, we became aware of the decision of the board after the January 11th um, vote. Um, the community was given no prior notice and the relocation site selection was kept from the public until the time of that vote, which is very concerning. The site is a small old um, elementary school. It is half the size of most of the middle schools in our area. It is bordered by riparian areas um, upon calling your COO and various employees within the district, I found out there are no environmental studies, no traffic studies, no studies at all on whether or not this is a suitable location for 680 students. The streets that lead to the location are two very narrow, somewhat non-sidewalked locations and the student safety and the community impacts uh, for this site selection are immense. The fact that your employees have directly said there were no considerations in selecting the site other than proximity to students is very upsetting. This would destroy the only foraging area for all of our raptors. It, it is adjacent to uh, Creekside Nature Area. The impacts have not even been addressed or looked at. This is a horrible decision for these students. When discussing the size and layout of the, the property, no green space will be available, no outdoor athletic space for these students because you're taking 15 acres worth of area and you're shoving it into half that space. This is very concerning and we did ask that this be on tonight's agenda. It's doubly concerning that you are not willing to publicly address it in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Carly Krebs. Carly, please go ahead and unmute when you're ready. I just wanted to respond to the previous comment regarding myocarditis. Um, I, I just wanted to let you know, there's a lot of studies out there that show myocarditis is actually um, six times higher to happen in children who um, get COVID infection as opposed to those who have received the vaccine. So that was it. I just wanted to, to point that out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Go you. ahead. Next, we have Marina Gable. When you are ready, Ms. Gable. Hello. Um, I just want to let everybody know that there are members of the school board that are a buddy buddy with Dr. Pan. So be scared for your children. Um, today's protest is proof. Everyone knows it's out. San Juan is torturing our children. The only the only thing these school board meetings are good for is promoting our fight against the district. If anyone would like to join in the fight, please get a pen and paper now. These are Facebook pages. I will repeat them twice. San Juan Unified Parents Chat, Sacramento School Districts Unite, Stand Up Sacramento County, and Sacramento Rise Up. Again, San Juan Unified Parents Chat, Sacramento School Districts Unite, Stand Up Sacramento County, and Sacramento Rise Up. When the school board or district says we're only doing what we are told, they are lying to you. Everything the district has done to our children, they chose to do. They were only recommendations from the CDC. One more time, only recommendations. They chose to go forward and enforce. They have done this because they have sold out your children for ESSER funds. You, if you haven't heard what happened at Roosevelt Joint, you're watching the wrong news. Their kids and parents are free to choose. So 
I'm giving you some recommendations, San Juan. Write a resolution to end masks, testing, the shot, because it's not a vaccine, et cetera, forever. Never again will this be an option at this school district. <clears throat> recommendation number two, give back the ESSER funds, CARES Act funds, whatever funds that you took. Release our children. They are worth more than... Thank you very Thank much. You. Your time is up. Thank you very much. And next we have Michael Seaman. When you are ready, Mr. Seaman. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, board members. Um, I am very I'm a Creekside neighbor and I'm very concerned about the proposal to uh, rush a middle school into the Creekside site. Uh, I do believe that there was inadequate uh, staff work done. There was not prior notice to uh, all the appropriate stakeholders, including our park district. And I think that two recent uh, court cases in the third appellate uh, court where uh, Placer County lost to Sierra Watch uh, strongly indicate that need to in, do the appropriate uh, due diligence and environmental studies prior to making a decision. Um, I'm very concerned about items like traffic, pedestrian safety, environment, environmental justice. Uh, I want access to the nature area. Uh, at all times for the public, at least from dawn to dusk. And uh, <clears throat> I'm concerned about the need for open space there. The uh, Creekside School Surplus School site is the only open space in the immediate area for the neighbors who very much uh, need and use the site. And, and they should have access to that open space whenever uh, school is uh, not in session. So I recommend that, that your district pause your process and, and seek a consensus from all the appropriate stakeholders um, prior to rushing into a judgment. And thank you for your comments. And the last raised hand we have is from Eva C. Eva, whenever you're ready, please go ahead and unmute. Thank you, can I be heard? Yes. We could hear you. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so my name is Eva, and I am a resident um, right on the block where the Creekside uh, area is supposed to be turned into a school or a middle school. Um, and I have a lot of concerns and issues to bring up about it. Um, I live on the block, so I don't see how any community outreach was done with the neighborhood there. And after living there for a couple of years, I've seen how much the surrounding community uses and appreciates the space and the nature space, especially um, a lot of refugees from other countries and many children who are packed in cramped apartments and all who hang out and play and use this space. So when it comes to like what is best for the community, I don't see how bulldozing the green space and um, changing that would be something beneficial. When I've emailed and checked in with um, people who have made these decisions, um, it looks like there hasn't been any traffic studies done. I mean, I really want to ask, have you gone and driven on these streets? Because there's literally, they're very small, tiny streets and it's dangerous, straight up dangerous for kids. Are we putting in traffic lights on every single corner, that kind of thing? Um, as well as environmental studies being done. It's right next to the nature preserve. So how will that affect the nature preserve? How will all of this um, car exhaust and engine exhaust in this small space uh, affect us? So I'd like to know what kind of outreach, public outreach is gonna be done. And I really encourage you guys to stop and pause, go to the space, check in with the community and see what other spaces can be used because um, yes, this might be fantastic and needed as far as a middle school, but also what does the wider community need and what, what damage are we doing or mistakes are we making that we can't undo? So thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Next we have, we had a couple more raised hands, President McKibben that popped yeah. up. Um, next we have Dylan Wood. Please go ahead and proceed. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Dylan Wood. I'm a permitting specialist with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, I would just like to echo some of the concerns that a few of the neighbors have raised regarding the Creekside site. Um, this is an important riparian uh, connection for many fish and wildlife species in our local Sacramento area. Um, and I would encourage any members of the board or staff with the school district um, to further look at some of the environmental impacts and potentially consult with our department on ways to avoid, minimize, and potentially mitigate any adverse impacts to the environment. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And our next raised hand is Matthew Sagrace. Please go ahead when you're ready. Yes, um, my name is Matthew. I am a resident um, by Creek. Um, I feel this borgence in uh, public notice. I believe that it has not uh, been forthright and they have tried to, uh, for a better lack of terms, sneak in this um, process of uh, building a school at Creekside Park. I believe that the expenditure of money that has already taken place, um, it's tax dollars and then tax dollars that will be spent on a school that may or may not be built due to the infrastructure limitations and possibly the uh, floodplain, uh, waters of the US and um, environmental impact studies may limit the uh, size of the school that they are doing. So I am greatly disappointed with the due diligence of this board and the idea that they can shove in a uh, 680, 700 student uh, campus into a nine acre lot with no green space. You're doing a disservice to the students that would possibly go there by not allowing them to have an open space for physical education and any other uh, type of uh, recreation in the space, let alone to the community, taking away the green space that we have there. Uh, we are bordered by Fulton Avenue, Watt Avenue, El Camino, and Marconi, and that is the only green space uh, that is open to the public to be used. Um, I would hope that the uh, board reevaluates and gets out and takes a um, more um, forward approach in uh, communicating with the uh, community members that uh, this is going to affect. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And President McKibben, that is the last speaker we have for public comment at this time. Uh, thank you very much. I, I would remind, uh, remind people there is a second uh, opportunity for uh, comments at the end of the meeting. Uh, uh, we now move to item G, the consent calendar. Uh, Ms. Rye, do we have any public comment I I items on the consent calendar? We do not have any raised hands at this time, Dr. McKibben. Do any board members wish to remove any items from the consent calendar? Dr. McKibben, I would like to remove item G8 and abstain from the item. So I request that it be voted on independently. Yes, and uh, so we will remove uh, G8 uh, 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 as pulled by Ms. Fiascas. Is there a motion to approve items G1 through G7? So moved. Uh, moved by, by Ms. Fiascas. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Uh, uh, Reeson. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those, those, those opposed? Uh, that was unanimous. We now, we now move to uh, item H and I, Dr. item- Kevin, Dr. Yes, we need thank to you. take care of G8. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, uh, we now move to item H. Uh, which where we will take care of G8. Uh, item is item G8 is the certification of absence uh, was which was pulled by Ms. Viasquez. Is there a motion to approve G8? So moved. Moved by Mr. Hernandez. Seconded by. Second. Uh, Ms. Costa. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, abstentions. I would like to abstain. Okay, it is uh, uh, four, uh, four eyes and one ex extension. Okay, thank you very much. Now we move on to item I, uh, the business items. The first one is local, uh, the local control and, uh, and accountability plan, mid-year update. Ms. 
Bessinelli. Good evening, President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. On June 22nd, 2021, the Board of Education approved San Juan Unified's Local Control Accountability Plan, also known as the LCAP, which was drafted utilizing input from a variety of educational partners throughout our district. This plan outlines a broad set of actions and services that are designed to meet the needs of students overall, but specifically our English learner, low income, foster youth and homeless students. Since July 1st, 2021, LCAP actions and services have been implemented in coordination with actions and services identified in the board approved ELO and ESSER 3 expenditure plans. Tonight's presentation will provide you a report on available mid-year outcome data related to our LCAP metrics, mid-year expenditure and implementation data on all actions identified in the LCAP, and the supplement to the annual update for the 2021-22 LCAP as required by Section 124E of Assembly Bill 130. At this time, I would like to welcome Gian, Gian Tornatore, Director of Continuous Improvement in LCAP, to present to you the 2021-22 Local Control and Accountability Plan Mid-Year Update. Good evening, President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. This evening, we are here to present the San Juan Unified School District's Local Control and Accountability Mid-Year Update. California's 2021-22 Budget Act, the Federal American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, and other state and federal relief acts have provided local educational agencies with a significant increase in funding to support students, teachers, staff, and their communities in recovering from and addressing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Section 124E of Assembly Bill 130 requires local educational agencies to present an update on the annual update to the 2021-22 Local Control and Accountability Plan and Budget Overview for Parents on or before February 28, 2022 at a regularly scheduled meeting of a governing board or body of the LEA. This evening, we will be providing the board with a mid-year update on the implementation of expenditure plan actions for the LCAP ELO and ESSER 3 plans, available 2021-22 LCAP metrics outcome data, and finally, a parent and community budget overview. By integrating the planning process of the LCAP ELO and ESSER 3 expenditure plans, San Juan has created a comprehensive three-year plan that braids the funds, actions, services, and strategies of each plan listed here in order to address the immediate and long-term impact of COVID-19. Specifically, addressing students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs, as well as continuous and safe in-person learning with an emphasis on, on our targeted student groups. The process we have taken to create our multi-year strategy that aligns all three plans began two years ago. The development of our LCAP began in January 2020, but was then suspended from April through December 2020 due to COVID. In January 2021, work on the LCAP resumed after guidance was provided by the California Department of Education. In March of 2021, we simultaneously began developing our ELO plan with the intention of building on and expanding the programs, services, and community input identified on our LCAP. Finally, in August of 2021, we developed our ESSER 3 plan using a similar process of engaging our educational partners for input, as well as building and expanding on the actions from our LCAP and ELO expenditure plans. So what did this process look like? <clears throat> as part of San Juan's continuous improvement efforts, community input was collected to help inform the LCAP, ELO, and SO3 expenditure plans in the form of listening sessions, surveys, and small and large group listening sessions. The information on this slide and the following two slides was previously shared with the board on May 11th, 2021 in our ELO presentation, June 8th, 2021 in our LCAP presentation, and October 12th, 2021 in our ESSER 3 presentation. In developing these three plans, San Juan was committed to developing, maintaining, and expanding engagement with our educational partners to shape and influence each plan's actions and expenditures. Our educational partners included students, families, employee and labor groups, and community partners that were engaged through participation in listening sessions, 
which were conducted in one-on-one -on -one conversations, small groups and large groups, in order to meet the various needs of our partners. Upon reviewing the input received from our educational partners, several high-level key themes emerged from all three plans. The themes focused on addressing the immediate and long-term impact of COVID-19 in two areas. One, strategies to address students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs. And two, strategies for continuous and safe in-person learning that reduce or prevent the spread of COVID-19. These themes were then used to develop and align actions across all three plans that build and expand on one another in order to provide a cohesive and comprehensive strategy. The ongoing ebb and flow of the pandemic has impacted the implementation of these plans resulting in many challenges. However, in implementing these plans, we have also been able to increase and expand many programs, services, and resources for our students, resulting in many successes as well. For example, some of the successes we have experienced include increased local control at the site level to address targeted student and site needs, an expanded site level staffing, summer offerings, community partnerships, materials and supplies, and enrichment and intervention opportunities. Conversely, some of the challenges that we have experienced include staff and substitute shortages, keeping schools safe and open during surges, and maintaining continuity of learning and implementation of programs. With regard to our LCAP actions and metrics, at this point in the school year, all of our actions are currently in progress and being implemented. However, some metric outcomes are known and some are unknown. For example, our district climate survey is currently being administered. So this metric outcome is currently, uh, is not, is currently not available. However, state assessment data was recently released and is available. An update on all actions and metrics that are currently available at this point in the school year are available in attachments C and D. So when reviewing the data, we would like to offer some considerations related to, to the metrics. Although the federal testing requirement was waived for the 2019-20 school year, the U.S. Department of Education informed states that for the 2020-21 school year, they were required to administer statewide academic assessments in English language arts, mathematics, and science, as well as English language proficiency assessments. Both the school board and California uh, Department of Education recognized that the administration of these state assessments was not feasible because most districts were in remote learning until well into the spring. Therefore, to maximize the collection of evidence of student performance, LEAs were able to administer local assessments in lieu of CASP. While educators, parent guardians, and community partners are always encouraged to use a variety of data when making decisions about education programs and policies, in this time of COVID and disrupted data, the Department of Education is recommending that direct comparisons to the 2020-21 test results from prior years is not advisable. For example, in 2018-19, prior to COVID-19, approximately 97% of San Juan eligible students were assessed in ELA and mathematics. In 2019-20, the testing requirement was waived, so no San Juan students completed the CASP. In 2020-21, LEAs had the flexibility to administer the state assessment or a local assessment. So in San Juan, only 11th grade students completed the CASP which represents approximately 6% of eligible students, and third through eighth grade students were administered the iReady local assessment in lieu of CASP. Another factor to consider are the shifts in assessment administration. For example, before COVID in 2018-19, all assessments were administered in person. In March of 2019-20, however, we began our transition to administering assessments virtually. In the case of CASP, the assessment was waived entirely. And in the case of the IB exam, students were assessed virtually using local internal assessments. In 2021, we started virtually, but then were able to include in-person administration whenever possible as we transitioned into hybrid learning. And finally, this school year, our fall and winter assessments were administered in person, and we plan on being able to administer our spring assessments in person as well. 
Collectively, this information is intended to provide some context and considerations as to the what, when, and how assessments were administered as we review, interpret, and take potential action on the data provided. In the next few slides, I'm gonna share with you a few notable LCAP metrics, all of which can be found in attachment C of the board packet. Before doing so, however, I would like to provide you an update on our average daily attendance for TK through 12th grade. Prior to COVID, our ADA percentage was roughly 95%. In 2021, we saw a slight increase, but it is worth noting, noting that this was the year we were in distance learning and hybrid learning. And as of the end of January, 2022, our ADA percentage has decreased to 89.52%. When we look at chronic absenteeism, you will notice that this data represents TK through eighth grade students and not TK through 12th grade students. This is because the California dashboard chronic absenteeism indicator is for TK through eighth grade um, students only. A student is considered a chronic absentee if the student is absent at least 10% of the instructional days. This includes excused absences, unexcused absences, and out of school suspensions. It is important to consider when reviewing this data, the definition of chronic absenteeism, which is determined at the state level, has not changed during this time of COVID. This is one of the factors that is contributing to the sharp increase in chronic absenteeism we are seeing between the 2020-21 school year and the 2021-22 school year to date. For example, absences related to COVID are included in the 2021-22 data seen here. In other words, our current chronic absenteeism rate can include a student who is absent because they tested positive for COVID and are in quarantine, as well as a student who tested negative for COVID but are required to isolate because they are exhibiting COVID-related symptoms. If we look at chronic absenteeism by student group, we see that our homeless and African-American students have disproportionately higher chronic absenteeism rates and consequently lower attendance rates as well. In speaking with our attendance office staff who are working directly with our students and families, we are hearing and learning about some of the factors that may be contributing to this outcome. These include limited access to childcare, technology, transportation, healthcare, and basic living needs, as well as a need for us to build trust and relationships with our homeless and, Af and African American communities. To address these barriers, we have provided technology devices, internet access to students, free bus passes, access to mental health support, food and clothing, and our McKinney Vento program is needed. To build trust and relationships with our students and families, we've been intentional about making our outreach more personal through individual phone calls and home visits, and working in collaboration um, with our students and families by co-creating routines and plans that are reflective of their needs. Another noteworthy finding in our data is that our EL and reclassified fluent English proficient students have lower chronic absenteeism rates compared to our overall rate. This year, our EL department has been focusing on improving communication. At the central office level, our EL and FACE departments are working closely to coordinate presentations around chronic absenteeism and attendance, specifically with members in our Valeres Familiares program. And at the site level, school community resource assistants are increasing communication with families around attendance and making home visits. To give you a picture of what this looks like, a story was shared uh, with me um, was of a middle school newcomer student who had siblings in elementary school. The elementary school students did not have attendance issues. However, the middle school student had not attended school since their enrollment. Central office and school staff worked together to connect with the family and learned that in order to get to school, the middle school student had to cross a busy street. The number of cars, lights, and activity was overwhelming and made the student afraid. A school community resource assistant met with the student and practiced walking to, uh, to school together and provided support on how to use the crosswalk in a safe manner, which ultimately addressed the attendance issue for the student. It's this type of intentional focus on communication and relationship building, as well as collaboration within and across departments that has resulted in lower, lower uh, chronic absenteeism and higher attendance rates for our English learners compared to our overall rate.
The English learner reclassification metric represents the percentage of English learners who are reclassified to fluent English proficient. In 2019-20, the state requirement for reclassification changed and 5.2% of our English learners were reclassified. By the end of the 2020-21 school year, we reclassified 4.5% of our English learners. And we have currently reclassified 396 students um, as of the end of January, which represents 6.2% of our English learners. Some of the shifts in practice that our EL department made that contributed to the increase in reclassification were to provide additional access and opportunity for our English learners. This included contacting each school site personally and providing direct one-on-one -on -one support to the school sites, increasing central support from the departments to assist schools with the reclassification process, adjusting the criteria for reclassification so it is aligned to grade level expectations, so for example, students in kindergarten and first grade were previously assessed using second grade level expectations, but now students in kindergarten and first grade are being assessed on grade level expectations. Including, and finally, including iReady is an additional opportunity for students to demonstrate mastery of language. The graduation metric is the percentage of students who graduate high school within four years. When looking at this metric over time, you will notice that the overall graduation rate has remained stable over the last three years, which is consistent with the state average. However, when looking at our student subgroups, we noticed that our English learn language learners and foster youth student groups had declining graduation rates. This is an area that we are currently studying and diving into more deeply to better understand the underlying causes that are contributing to this outcome so that we can design targeted actions to address this problem. For example, with regard to our English learners, we are seeing an increase in long-term English learners in high school who are receiving English learner services. As we investigate this issue more deeply, some questions that are guiding our inquiry include, in what ways, if at all, are English learner services impacting a student's course of study and meeting graduation requirements? Also, how can we improve our outreach to families to better communicate knowledge of graduation requirements, as well as options related to EL services? Similarly, with regard to our foster youth students, we are currently reviewing data to better understand the factors that are contributing to this outcome. One notable trend that we are noticing is that foster youth students who attend high school in our district for three and four years tend to meet graduation requirements. Another notable trend is that many of our foster youth students are receiving special education services. And finally, we are noticing that while most foster youth students are receiving tutoring services, few foster youth students are participating in our credit recovery program. So based on these observations, some of the questions that we are using to guide our inquiry include, how can we better support foster youth students in meeting graduation requirements who are entering San Juan in their junior and senior year of high school? In what ways, if at all, are special education services impacting a student's course of study and meeting graduation requirements? And how can we increase foster youth uh, student participation in our credit recovery program? And lastly, the A through G or CTE completion metric represents the percentage of graduating seniors who meet the A through G college requirements or complete at least one CTE uh, pathway. When looking at the A through G or CTE completion metrics over time, we notice that while we see a decrease between 2018 and 19 and 2019 20, the percentage of students who meet the A through G or CTE requirements in 2020 21 has increased from the pre COVID year of 2018 19 for all student groups except foster youth students. We also notice that some student groups, such as our African American students, increased at a greater rate. This is leading us to follow similar lines of inquiry to better understand how specialized services and programs might be impacting a student's course of study and meeting graduation requirements that support A through G or CTE completion as well. It is important to note that while earning a D in a class meets the criteria for graduation, it does not meet the A through G requirement. This is an important distinction that has informed the actions we have taken to increase the number of students who meet the A through G requirements. These actions include offering credit recovery opportunities to students to recover credits if they failed a course or for grade improvement if the student earned a D using APEX, 
which is a flexible, safe, self-paced, mastery-based online learning platform for students to retake a course. Another uh, action is establishing community partnerships with Improve Your Tomorrow, and United College Action Network that specifically support African-American students to be A through G qualified, as well as equal opportunity schools to increase access for African-American students in AP courses. Additionally, providing mentorship, support, and structure to be prepared and eligible for college through our AVID program. And finally, implementing a process where counselors analyze and review transcripts over summer to ensure accuracy and validation for math and world language courses. So for example, if a student earns a D in IM1, but then earns a C minus or better in IM2, the transcript is manually changed and validated to reflect that the student has met the A through G criteria for both IM1 and IM2. So from 2017 to 2019, the California School Dashboard Performance Indicators were used to identify districts for differentiated assistance. Due to the impact of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, the status of districts identified for differentiated assistance continues to be based on 2019 performance. In July 2021, Education Code 52064E5 was amended, which now requires LEAs to include a goal in the LCAP Focus on improving the performance of student subgroups that meet the criteria for differentiated assistance for three or more consecutive years. Because our California dashboard graduation rate and college and career readiness performance indicator was read for three consecutive years for these two student groups, San Juan is required to write a specific LCAP goal or goals to outline support for students with disabilities and foster youth that focuses on improving graduation rate and college career readiness outcomes. We have recently formed an improvement team that is currently reviewing data to better understand the factors that are contributing to this outcome for our foster youth and students with disabilities in order to identify actions to improve in these two areas. Next, I would like to provide you with an update on our 2021-22 budget. When San Juan adopted its budget on June 22nd, 2021, the State Budget Act and American Rescue Plan Act were not complete. The, the, but the adopted state and federal budgets included additional funds that were not anticipated by our district, which you can see most prominently in our increase of $12,773,178 in state funds and $76,848,000 in federal funds. You will also notice that San Juan did not receive concentration grant add-on funding. This was due to the fact that our three-year average enrollment of low income, English learner and or foster youth students in San Juan is 53.39%, which is less than the 55% required to receive funding. Lastly, in reviewing our expenditures, we are on track to spending our plan allocations. And finally, our next steps with uh, regard to our LCAP include continuing listening sessions with our educational partners, which are currently in progress, meeting with our LCAP PAC to review our mid-year metrics, district climate survey, listening session themes, and 2022-23 draft LCAP, including an additional goal focused on improving graduation rate and college career readiness for our foster youth and students with disabilities, presenting revisions to LCAP to the board in June, and lastly, throughout our system, we will continue uh, to use equity-driven continuous improvement practices to reflect on the data, adjust actions, and monitor progress for improvement. President McKibben, this concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions from the board. Thank you very much, Dr. Tora, Tora, Tora. Uh, that, uh, Ms. Rye, do we have any public comments on the LCAP uh, item? We do not have any raised hands at this time. Just a reminder for participants that if you'd like to provide a public comment on this agenda item, please go ahead and raise your hand. Um, the raise hand button is found at the bottom of your screen on a mobile device, at the bottom of the participant list on a desktop Zoom client, or by pressing star nine if you joined via phone. Okay, I'll wait a bit of time, see if there's anybody that responds. And I'm, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Okay. 
All right, we will move uh, then to uh, board member questions and comments. Uh, Ms. Viasquez. Thank you for, for the presentation and um, for navigating us through now a couple of years of um, some pretty significant um, challenges. I also just want to acknowledge the hard work of the LCAP PAC committee that meets on a frequent basis to provide input on these items as well. Um, one question I do have kind of requires you or Ms. Bassanelli to kind of look into a crystal ball, but I'm just wondering moving forward, do we anticipate any guidance from the state in terms of any kind of baseline corrections or something like that moving forward with COVID? I mean, like our assessment levels are where they are and we obviously will continue to meet our kids where they're at. I just am wondering how that impacts very structured things that we've worked with and worked to include in the past, such as kind of the rubrics and the different metrics, et cetera. Uh, welcome any thoughts there, if either of you have any. Well, at this time, the uh, California Department of Education has not provided additional guidance on that front, but um, uh, we are currently receiving updates frequently. And so we'll be monitoring that. Um, and as updates arise, we'll be notifying, um, of course, our LCAT PAC and, and the board as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, please. I just wanna thank you for the report. It was very thorough, uh, a lot of information and appreciate you uh, updating us and continue to keep us on the path. And uh, thank you again for the report. Okay, uh, uh, Ms. Costa. I would also like to thank you for the report. I look at the successes and I think the entire team has done an amazing job in terms of adding the personnel to really support our students in academic, social, emotional, mental health, the areas of mental health. And I am very grateful that we have the funds to be able to do that, especially during the pandemic. I thought that your example of helping a student by actually modeling how to walk to school and get across a busy street is indicative of the kind of support that our staff is doing to support students during the pandemic. And I'm just very grateful to each and every one of them. And as a new member of the LCAP PAC, it is really, has been really positive to listen to this discussions with them. So thank you for everyone for their hard work. Uh, Ms. Creason. Thank you for the report. I echo um, my colleague's statements. It was really great to hear the story of the one-on-one -on -one support that was provided to the student. And I really believe that that's the story that we need to tell of what it really takes. We meet folks, students and families where they're at to help them however we can to get them to complete their educational program. And that looks different for everybody and for different reasons. So thank you for sharing that story. Um, one of the big questions I was going to ask was about attendance. So thank you for breaking down, you know, the COVID layer to that. I really do hope that we are able to um, correct or better understand how we got to that number in the future. Um, because I know a lot of folks did their job and when they thought there might be an issue, kept their kid home. Um, but there really aren't a lot of adjustments to the attendance requirement. Gotcha. One thing I wanted to bring up, and I know that we are fabulous in our district working with community partners. And um, when we were talking about our um, young folks that are in the foster services system, you know, I do a in day job land, I do a lot of work with opportunity use as it relates to workforce development issues. And it just made me think, I'm wondering, have we, or do we now and have we in the past, or could we maybe explore something for, you know, a discussion another day? 
maybe talking to some statewide organizations that specialize in working with opportunity youth, not necessarily specifically in our K through 12 space, but more broadly in workforce development and other issues. And I keep saying opportunity youth, like everyone knows what that means. Um, generally, it's young folks between about 15 and about 24, the definition changes a little bit, depending on who you ask, that aren't connected to work, they're not connected or tangentially um, connected to education, um, involved in uh, justice systems or in foster care. So I'm just wondering, are we working with these broader organizations or is that something we can maybe explore for now? We can certainly explore those. Um, um, I am aware that we have some contacts at the, both at the county level and at the state level that we can reach out to uh, for um, assistance and guidance as well for additional ideas. So I appreciate you sharing that because that would be uh, one of our next steps. Okay, and we can talk offline about it, but it's just something that, you know, the shining red star when you say, when we were talking about that population, I'm like, I know that there's a lot of good work going on and a ton of money at the state level going to workforce development. Um, and some of that is being marked for OY. So there might be some bridging there that could help just a lot. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you so much for the report. It was really um, very comprehensive. So I didn't walk away with a ton of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greeson. I did, uh, I did have a, a couple of uh, things that I wanted to ask related to findings, uh, uh, particularly related to the uh, uh, English learner classification and, and others. Uh, the approximately 400 students that were reclassified uh, and how does that, is that, do we know how that compares to other districts uh, with in similar circumstances to ours? Or can you get back to me on that one? That was just a curiosity, and I'm sorry I didn't ask it beforehand. Yes, Dr. McKibben, we can certainly get back to you um, and uh, with some comparisons of our reclassification rate compared to other neighboring school districts. Because it has been going up, uh, and, it, and it looks like a like a win. But I wanted to know uh, whether what, what the factor was. Okay. Mm -hmm. My second second question has to do with with the, uh, the anecdote you, you talked about, about the child crossing the street and so forth. And my, my curiosity on this one is, this would seem to be something that would be, uh, these kinds of issues would be hard to surface. How do we, how do we come upon these things? Or is it kind of a, uh, it was a fascinating story and, and, and plotted to all of you that, that, that did this, but. Uh, my next question is, how frequently does it happen and how do we find out? Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned, our English learning department has made an intentional effort to improve communication and increase communication. Um, and that is relying on our school community resource assistance, um, our central staff, um, uh, our bilingual instructional assistance. So we're always looking for opportunities to develop those relationships with our families. And so a lot of that begins with those direct connections with families at the school site. And of course, as more uh, contacts are made and, and uh, more interactions occur um, that are intentional, uh, that is when trust develops over time. And we are able to uh, begin to better understand what the, those factors are that might be contributing to, in this case, a student's um, fear of, of, of or attendance issue because of fearing of crossing the street. So it really is a comprehensive approach that, that includes um, intentional communication, but also really focusing on developing those trusting relationships with our mm -hmm. community. You bet. Thank you very much. And I, I, the, your, your explanation makes absolute sense. And, and it is uh, all of us, the face group, all of us the, working together on this kind of thing. My last one had to do with something that I, uh, I heard, I think I heard, but I want to make sure. And that was, uh, if we have a foster youth for four years is when we're seeing significant gains. Did I hear that correctly? Or uh, uh, please correct me if I did not hear that quite right. Yeah, and in, in, in examining some of our uh, preliminary data, what we're noticing is a, is a trend is that foster youth students who are uh, with us in San Juan for three or four years, um, we are seeing the, uh, a trend that they are more likely to graduate uh, high school as compared to our foster youth students that are with us for less than three or four years. That's terrific. And I have not, that's, that's a new finding for us, right? I have not heard that one before. 
Yes, and like I said, we are uh, beginning with our improvement team, and so we are looking at some um, some data. And this was one of the uh, initial observations that we made um, in our data recently. All right, thank you very much, and and Ms. Bessinelli and and Dr. Tornatore, thank you very much for this report. There was lots of really good things in there, and also some places where we need to grow and get better. But uh, that's exactly what these reports are about. Thank you very much. We thank, and now we move to the choices charter local control and accountability plan uh, mid-year update. Uh, Mr. Getter. Good evening, President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kern, Ms. Cunningham. Um, as you said, uh, we are here this evening with uh, Mr. Tony Oder, School Director of Choices Charter School. Uh, Superintendent is recommending that the board review the 2021-2022 LCAP mid-year update and the new required supplement to the LCAP annual update for Choices Charter. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Odo as I share our screen with you for the presentation. All right. Good evening, uh, President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. Thank you for the opportunity to update you on our progress with regards to our LCAP goals. Um, next slide. Um, I'd like to also thank John uh, as well for providing uh, that thorough background for this report. Um, he, the district representative has always helped save me some time uh, it, it, so that I can present, uh, present this in a timely fashion for you. So uh, we can move on here to slide three. Um, of course, our expenditure plans are focused on addressing the needs of low income EL and foster youth students in a physically and mentally safe environment. We do our best to address the multitude of needs created by COVID-19 related to learning loss and social, emotional, and mental health needs. Slide five. In creating and implementing our plans, we solicit input from multiple sources of our educational community partners. This includes, of course, our advisory council, teachers, parents, students, classified employees, school leadership team, uh, and others. The um, key themes are listed here. As a small school, we need to be careful with how we allocate our resources. Recently, the district has been extremely helpful in supporting choices with technology resources, as well as COVID-19 mitigation resources. Over the years, we have developed strategies to support students academically and psychologically. For the last several years, the number of students self-reporting issues with anxiety has increased drastically. Our end of year student surveys indicate that student anxiety is reduced by our flexible scheduling options, which allow students to attend classes when they feel up to it and remain independent learners at home as needed. Our strong and safe school climate has been highly regarded by students and parents alike for many years. Uh, budgets for independent study programs, which are work product based, can fluctuate greatly in a small school. We are budgeting using the best guess method and enrollment is difficult to predict. And we never really know our true numbers until year end, once our final attendance ADA is calculated. The COVID era has made budget projections even more difficult. Our current most recent projections for this school year show us deficit spending. Luckily, over the last several years, Choices has been able to create a good sized fund balance. Additionally, rec recent legislation put forward in the Capitol may help alleviate our shortfall and maybe even negate it. Time will tell, and as usual, we won't really know until the budget is passed this summer. Here's a partial list of some of our successes at Choices. I'll address some of these when discussing our LCAP metrics but I wanted to highlight a few items that are not listed in those metrics. Independent study is a different experience than traditional programs, and both students and parents can have difficulty adjusting. To this end, we have worked hard to provide resources online and in person to help our families integrate more easily. Teachers have help resources in their syllabi, embedded in their online lessons, and provide outside links to additional resources as needed. We also provide short video lessons on our website that show parents and students how to navigate our SIS and LMS, 
as well as how to complete processes and procedures unique to independent study. This year, we debuted our Choices College and Career Week, which we hope to make an annual event. We also added iReady for enhanced disaggregated formative assessments. We have faced many challenges over the last two years. Uh, these are listed here on slide nine and include several listed by John earlier. A couple that stand out include lower than expected enrollment, the number of students enrolling at choices with multiple challenges and disadvantages, and a high transiency population. We've, we've recently received a large influx of students registering and enrolling. Uh, unfortunately, many of them have not been in school either for the last semester or even since the beginning of the school year. These create extreme challenges to, uh, to help our kids uh, mitigate learning loss, as well as just catch up on their graduation requirements. Over the last few years, the graduation rate of choices has risen over 10%, with a goal for 23-24 school year of 78%. This is still below state and district averages, but based on the number of students transferring to us on, uh, not on track to graduate, we see this improvement as a real positive. Progress has been made academically in test scores as well. The achievement gap for socially disadvantaged students compared to all students grew 10% beyond our goal set for 23-24. Next slide, please, Brian. The achievement gap between EL students and all students blew past our goal for 23-24, going from 2% below all students to 19% above. Math results for socioeconomically disadvantaged students compared to all students also improved from a 2% below gap to all students to 19, or excuse me, from 8% below to 11% above. Please. The achievement gap in math for EL students compared to the total population also jumped from 3% above to 9% above. The rest of our LCAP metrics on this slide Slides 13 and 14 are all un unavailable, unfortunately, at this time. So at this point, I'm happy to take questions from the board. Ms. Rye, do we have any public uh, comments on this item? I am not seeing any raised hands at this time. Okay, well, we will then move to uh, uh, board members. Uh, uh, Ms. Fiasquez, please. I have no questions, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hernandez. No questions, thank you. Ms. Costa. Thank you for your report. The growth with your socioeconomically disadvantaged students in graduation, ELA and math were really great. Congratulations. Thank you. Ms. Creason. Thank you for the update, no questions. Okay, and, and I, I too want to congratulate you on the, on the the kinds of uh, aids that you had made related to mental health that you talked about earlier, as well as the gains that you've made uh, from uh, uh, over, the, over the last year in the, uh, in the LCAP metrics. Congratulations on those. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you uh, for the report. We will move on now to item I3, redistricting trustee map uh, boundaries and uh, uh, Ms. Simlick and Michelle Cannon will be presenting this item. Thank you and good evening, President McKibben, board members, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. The superintendent is recommending that the board discuss the proposed trustee area maps and adopt resolution number 4006, approving adjustments to the boundaries of the district's trustee areas. Um, I will introduce Ms. Michelle Cannon and also Mr. Justin Rich is available for comments. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We do have a short presentation for you if, you if you'd like us to go ahead and do that at this point. I think that would be appropriate. Okay, good. So I'm here and as um, Ms. Simulik just said, your demographer, Justin Rich is also present. I'll start the presentation and then Justin, if you'll jump in on your demographer portion, which is really the biggest portion, I'll go, I'm, I'm uh, doing the, the slides, so I'll move them forward to you, uh, for you when you just let me know. 
Great. Let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> Is that good? Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I thought we would start with uh, just again a really quick recap on where we are, uh, a, a few moments on the redistricting requirements, um, what the 2020 census uh, study results were, uh, a quick recap of the community outreach and input that you all did, that the district did. Um, we'll review the map adjustment options, and then we're hoping that tonight the board will feel prepared to go ahead and take action to uh, make a final map selection uh, and then close out this redistricting process. So a quick reminder, because it's been just a, a little bit before, uh, since we've last met and talked about this, the redistricting that you are doing is required by the education code. It's required by all districts every 10 years after the census data is um, released. Of course, <clears throat> it's a little unusual for you all to be doing this because you just created your maps last year, but regardless of that, you're still required to redo the redistricting, which is why you've been going through this process. And a reminder that the process is due um, under the law to be completely finished by March 1st. So your great timing having it done uh, in, the, um, in February uh, so that you meet that deadline. Um, the process was a little bit different than what we did to transition to district-based elections. There was essentially a lot more steps the first time around. And one of the, uh, you know, you had more um, public hearings, more map hearings. And one of the other big differences is that the county committee had to approve your uh, district-based elections when you first made that transition last year. That's not required for districts that are simply updating their trustee area maps, which is what you're doing at this time. So we won't be going to county committee for approval. Uh, the decision you make tonight to adopt the maps will be the final decision if you make the decision tonight. Okay, next we're gonna talk about the 2020 census data study and I'll let Justin take over at this point. Thank you, Michelle. Just as a point of reference, uh, we've included the existing trustee area map and just by uh, way of orientation, just it's it hasn't been that long since since we talked about this map. But uh, on this particular map, we've color coded the various trustee areas. And starting down in the southwestern portion of the district, trustee area number one is shown in yellow. Trustee area number two is just to the north of that and shown in green. Trustee area three is shown in red. Trustee area four is shown in blue to a little bit to the east there. Trustee area number five is in the northeastern portion of the district and it's shown in that pink color. Trustee area number six is shown in the tan color. And then trustee area seven is in that uh, teal or aqua color there. Um, the, the other two map scenarios will follow that same pattern and, and we'll, we'll have the, the, the trustee areas will be represented by those same colors. Uh, and we'll, we'll point that out when we get to that slide or to those slides. So I was with you all um, back when you, you adopted your trustee areas. Uh, and at that time, we hadn't received the final redistricting data uh, from the California Department of Finance. Uh, they took the data from the Census Bureau and ultimately made some adjustments and changes. And that's the data set that, that we're using uh, for, for, this for this process. Um, overall, what we saw is that there were some major changes, not surprisingly, from the 2010 census to the 2020 census. So we've included this table, which highlights those changes. It shows the overall growth within the district during that period of time was about 31,000 uh, in terms of total population. That's every single person counted. And that represents just under 10% uh, growth district-wide. What we also saw is that the variance between the most populated area and the least populated area uh, was outside of the 10% boundary, which is what we're shooting for. So that, that necessitated us to, to undertake this process. We've also included a uh, 
data comparison, just how the racial and ethnic uh, breakdown based on that census data. So we've included that table here. Uh, there were shifts in the population, and I think that just a general thought, the, the area that San Juan Unified serves uh, is becoming more diverse, and, and that is shown uh, in, in the data from the 2020 census. On this slide, we've, we've shown uh, the total population and the citizen voting age population by racial and ethnic category for each of the trustee areas. You'll see a line that says TP that represents the total population, and that's what's relevant just in terms of the variance, making sure that we're complying with the one person, one vote constitutional doctrine. Also, citizen voting age population, you'll recall, is a measure of voting strength uh, and in particularly important to ensure that we're complying with the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, the total population based on 2020 district-wide is 352,161. What that means is that when we divide that by the seven trustee areas, that means that the ideal size or the average size of those seven areas is 50,309. So uh, what when we make the, the, the changes that were made uh, in both of our scenarios, it's to close that gap and make sure that we're underneath that 10% threshold, uh, which is what we're targeting. Next slide. So the largest trustee area currently, uh, based on the trustee areas that you adopted is area one, and then the smallest trustee area is area seven. The difference between those two is 5,667 residents. Uh, and when we divide that by the ideal size or the average size, that's where we get that 11.3%. Uh, I, I will note that the two largest areas are trustee areas one and two, and then the uh, smallest or, or least populated area is area seven. That's it, thanks Michelle. Okay, next, just a quick recap of the community outreach, uh, outreach and input. Um, the district and your staff did a great job on making sure that there was a lot of community outreach efforts. We've just got a brief synopsis here. I know that at your last board meeting, you reviewed this data in more detail, so I'm not planning on going into any detail. Just wanted to make sure to, again, um, show the, the great efforts um, that were made to make sure that everyone was aware and that there was a lot of uh, outreach and input from the community to the extent possible. So just as a, the, the approach that we took to the two map scenarios that, that we shared with you all, um, first of all, both of the scenarios uh, have a variance of less than 10%, so they're legally valid based on that population uh, balancing requirement. Um, and given the need to balance the population in the larger or, or the more populated areas of areas one and two, and to increase the population in areas six and seven, it ultimately necessitated small changes be made to, to virtually every trust area, given that they're on opposite sides of the district. Uh, so, so that's the domino effect, and that, that's what you will see in both of the scenarios that, that we prepared. Um, like I said, we've, we've kept that same color coding. I'm sorry, previous slide. We've kept that same color coding um, option for you here. Just the, the, the same trustee areas correspond with the same colors. We've added the purple line there just so you can track the changes to each one of the trustee areas. So when a color crosses over that line, it indicates that it's uh, a boundary change and it would um, pull territory away from, from the other area. And um, again, I, I will just from a high level say that uh, there were small changes that we had to make to, to each one of the trust areas. We really focused on, uh, first of all, so, some of the input that was received uh, following the, um, the, the transition to district-based elections and, and some of the things that we heard when we reevaluated the population balance, uh, it gave us a chance to address some of those. Um, and what it also, uh, what we also did is just tried to make sure that we're using um, major major roads to, to the extent that we can, kind of logical uh, dividing lines that that typically make sense for for communities of interest. And so that's what's represented in the changes to the maps. 
So again, our um, on, on scenario one, the total variance is at 4.3%. Um, and the largest trust area in this particular scenario is area three, and the smallest trust area is now area one. I, I will also point out that the largest concentration of a protected class increased in, in this particular scenario, that's in area one with 19.9% of the Hispanic Latino voters based on citizen voting age population. Next slide. And then in scenario two, there were a lot of similar changes that, that we made um, that, that are similar to, to scenario one. We had to make some, some different changes uh, just, just to provide you with a different uh, look at those, uh, you know, what potential boundary options could be. And uh, primarily that was in the area of uh, areas two, three, and four, sort of how, how those intersected. That's where the major, major changes um, that, that we approached there. Next slide. In this particular scenario, the variance is slightly lower, down to 3.8%. Uh, the largest or most populated area is, is area two, and the least populated area is area one. And again, the largest concentration of a protected class is similar to the prior scenario that we shared with you. That's in area one, where 19.9% uh, of the Hispanic Latino um, voters based on citizen voting age population. Next slide. Okay, so with those two map options before you, you have the opportunity tonight to make a final selection if you are ready to do so. Um, your selection would be based on the 2020 census data that we just reviewed. Um, there's a draft resolution before you. Um, the resolution includes um, all of the work that you all have done to get to this point, uh, the recitals that are necessary to update uh, and select a new map. If you make that selection tonight and approve the resolution, then we will send that resolution to the Sacramento County Registrar of Voters um, by the 20, uh, February 28th deadline. Um, after that, there is generally communication um, with the Registrar of Voters and the Elections Office um, and with your demographer and other district staff to make sure that they've got the information and the files and all of the detail behind the newly um, revised and adopted maps. Um, so that they can have it all in place for the November 2022 elections. Um, the November 8th elections would be held using these updated maps. Um, the updated maps obviously also include the seven trustee areas, and that will be uh, those uh, two new uh, trustees will be elected for the first time um, in the November 8th election. Um, and then the current election sequencing which is in place um, from when you made the transition to by trustee uh, area elections last year uh, would stay in place and would be unchanged by the adoption of these updated maps. Any questions for us? Dr. McKibben, you, you are on mute. Okay, now, thank you very much. Uh, we will now turn uh, Ms. Rye to see if there's any public comment on this item. And as a reminder, if you'd like to provide a public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand. And at this time, we do have one raised hand, Dr. McKibben. Okay. Let's go ahead and have that comment. Perfect. Um, our first commenter is Michael Seaman. Mr. Seaman, please proceed when you're ready. Thank you. I would appreciate it if you could put uh, both of your uh, options up on the screen so the public could see uh, both at the same time. And then I wanted to uh, mention that uh, the Arden Arcade area has uh, a designated environmental justice area that um, continues to be overlooked by the redistricting process. Thank you for your comment. And I am not seeing any other raised hands at this time. Okay. 
We will now turn uh, to uh, the uh, uh, board members for comments and we'll begin with Ms. Fiasquez. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. And I'll just note that the, um, the maps are available in the agenda item in the board packet that's online. Um, I'm excited to be at this state of the process. Uh, it's been a long road for sure. Um, as was kind of covered in, in detail um, at the meeting, there's um, pretty minimal distinction between the two options that, that we have here. Um, but so in trying to kind of arrive at what the most appropriate um, decision might be, I went back and kind of revisited some of the student attendance um, scatter plot graphs that we had kind of collectively revisited in the original efforts around um, the CVRA. And um, I think scenario one that was presented better reflects the kind of student population that currently attends Del Campo. That's um, the biggest kind of, one of the bigger differences there is in trustee area number four. So I um, just wanted to, to raise that and kind of how it's, how it's laid out there, I think, um, kind of reflects where our kids actually go to school. Um, I did look in the other changes as well, and um, there wasn't a huge, um, a huge distinction or, or difference. And so all that's to say is that I wanted to uh, voice support and a preference for scenario one and um, when they're, you know, at the appropriate time, I'm happy to make a motion there accordingly. Thank you. We move to Mr. Hernandez. Thank you uh, for the report. We, as uh, my colleague mentioned, we have been doing this a very, very long time to get to this point. And my comment or my opinion will be based on the most recent uh, community outreaches. And uh, I was able to attend those. And um, actually, I attended the second one, but the read the, uh, got the report on the first. And that um, by far, the community uh, reference scenario one to be of their preference. So I do support as well as Ms. Fiasquez uh, scenario one and uh, largely because that's what the feedback, what the community gave to us. Thank you. And Ms. Costa. I also attended the community outreach meetings and I felt that BAP one matched what the community said to us. And I also am in support of MAP one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Creason. Thanks for the overview. I'm so glad we're at the end of this process as well. <laughs> um, and a couple of things. One, I just wanna reiterate again to community that this change in boundaries does not impact school boundaries at all. This is only for voting and going by from at large to by district voting. So this will change who you vote for as your school board representative, but again, has nothing to do with your school boundaries, which I know it gets confusing. I just wanna make sure folks know that. Um, you know, at the beginning, when we went through the first round of the process, um, you know, there was feedback just because of the population numbers that we just couldn't blend in um, into a draft. But um, in these new drafts, we were able to pick up some of that community feedback, including, um, you know, the southern tip. Really, it's where I live, you know, I just kick, kick, you know, covering some of that sever, some, uh, southern tip and blending that into district three or area three, I should say, and moving <clears throat> some of area one up north further. So um, I was really happy to see that we were able to do something with some of that community feedback because we heard so much of that and the numbers just didn't work for that at the time, but because of census, it does work. So I'm really glad to hear that and see that in these new maps. And I too support um, map one. I attended the community feedback meetings, the most recent, and several of the others. And also just want folks to know, we had an online comment process as well. We had Zoom meetings um, in two stages as we keep referencing. And so I too, and you know, this latest, or these latest drafts, uh, map one overwhelmingly was the preferred map. So thank you for everybody's time and patience and for folks that did take the time to provide feedback either now or in the first process, because both was needed to get us where we are today. Okay. Thank you, thank you uh, to everybody. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, 
uh, Cannon and Mr. Rich for pointing pointing out that uh, the times when the new two new uh, districts will be voting, uh, as well as uh, when the others will be voting in three years. Also, uh, uh, thank you to Ms. Creason for pointing out the difference between school boundaries and trustee uh, uh, trustee boundaries. They are different and and based upon uh, different kinds uh, of data. And, and finally, I wanna to thank to all of the uh, voters and parents that came out and, and as uh, the other uh, uh, school board members have pointed out, uh, clearly the opinion of those people was for uh, scenario number one. And so I believe uh, uh, a motion is in order and remember in the motion, the specific scenario needs to be put into the motion. And I believe Ms. Viasca has, has said that she wanted to do that. I move to adopt resolution number 4006 with in the second resolution clause plan number one identified. Okay, is there, I'm sorry, is there a second? I second the motion. Uh, Ms. Costa seconds the motion. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of uh, adopting resolution 4006 using scenario one as the, as the choice signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, that was unanimous. Thank you all very much for, for this uh, uh, process. Uh, and we will now move on to the COVID-19 update. Mr. Kern, I believe. I will be turning this over to Mr. Allen, who will be giving that update for us tonight. Thank you, Superintendent Kern, President McKibben, members of the board, Ms. Cunningham. I've got a couple of items for you tonight. I'll try and uh, move quickly uh, through them. The first is to just give an overview of current conditions and where we stand with COVID-19 in our community and our schools. And the good news is that those metrics are improving. So our county seven day average case rate in Sacramento County has fallen from 148.3 at our last board meeting on January 25th, uh, down to 38.2 cases per 100,000 residents. Uh, so that's a really good solid movement. Want to point out that the high point during this latest surge, the Omicron surge was 245.2. So we have fallen considerably from that high point. I believe that was the second week of January that we hit that high point. And just to give you some perspective for the entirety of the pandemic, uh, when we talk about that 245.2 or that 38.2 that we're at today, um, the high points earlier in the pandemic uh, are much closer to that 38.2. So that Delta wave uh, was around 46 cases per 100,000 was the high point for the Delta wave. And then the earlier wave uh, back in December of 2020, which was the absolute highest point before Omicron came around, was 63 cases per 100,000. So by historical terms, we are still uh, higher than we would like to see, uh, but we have certainly moved in the right direction and are continuing to move in the right direction in Sacramento County. So that's very good news for all of us. Locally here in the district, our active student positive cases have also fallen. So when we met last on January 25th, we were at 1,698 active student cases that we were monitoring within our school communities. Today, that number has fallen to 306 cases. Uh, for our staff, uh, we are down from 300 cases to, I believe it's 66 cases of active staff that we're monitoring. Um, and just to point out for folks, when we have those numbers on the dashboard, these are not necessarily cases that have spread within our schools. This is anybody who has reported having COVID that is connected to our schools that we're actively monitoring to make sure that those quarantine and isolation periods are observed. Um, so it does not necessarily mean that that spread is occurring in the school, uh, but it does mean that those folks within our school communities are being impacted by COVID-19. And then the other piece I wanted to update specifically to our efforts here in San Juan is around our COVID-19 testing program. So again, since we last met on January 25th, the district has administered 13,175 COVID-19 tests. Uh, that is less than our uh, prior weeks. So we do continue to see that demand for testing fall as we continue to see the number of cases and exposures fall. Uh, but we do continue to expand access to testing to make sure that anybody who wants to access that program has access. 
So not only do we continue to offer testing at each of our school sites, but we now operate three daily testing locations throughout the district. We had been operating just one. We are now at Sunrise Tech Center in the east, the Hemlock Annex uh, kind of in the center of the district, and then the Creekside Center in the west side of the district. We just opened, I believe it was today. Uh, and those again are gonna be open every day uh, for our families, students, and those folks who have registered to be a volunteer in our schools as well. The other two areas I want to update you on tonight are the latest information we've had from our state health officials and our local county health officials. So yesterday, Dr. Uh, Galley from the California Department of Public Health provided an update to uh, the state and our local media and, and state media. Um, so we of course listened into that with great interest. Um, so the good news there is the state as a whole is seeing those improving trends, just like we're seeing in Sacramento County. So the seven day case averages are coming down, hospitalizations and admissions to hospitals related to COVID-19 are coming down and the test positivity rate in the last month have all fallen considerably. So we continue to see those metrics move in the right direction. Um, and it, we're hopeful that those continue to go in that direction. One of the key points that uh, the good doctor pointed out for us was that hospitalizations are really declining according to the predicted state modeling. The state uses some really sophisticated modeling and they've been able to, with some pretty good accuracy, predict where the curves are going to go. Um, so we're very excited to see that this latest trend uh, shows in the model that we will continue to fall significantly uh, over the next few weeks in hospitalizations and so far, that actual data that's coming in is following that predicted model very, very well. So we would expect to see over the next several weeks continued improvement in those trends. Uh, so again, that's very, very good news for us. The big conversation of course was on masking requirements. Um, and as everybody I think knows, this uh, marks the day, uh, the last day that the general public is asked or required to have face coverings on in public settings if they're vaccinated. Starting tomorrow, the state is moving to requiring face coverings only for those who are not vaccinated in general public settings. Those who are vaccinated in general public settings can have the option of whether they want to wear those face coverings or not. That, however, does not uh, cover carry over to other settings. So healthcare, schools, childcare, long-term care facilities, those requirements from the California Department of Public Health to maintain the use of face coverings when indoors continue to be in place. And in schools, that applies to both our adults and our students. So our state officials are pointing to data that shows California schools have had fewer instances of school closure than other states. They're crediting not just face coverings, but that multiple level of COVID-19 prevention that we've all implemented. So those things like avoiding large gatherings, improving indoor ventilation, asking everybody to frequently wash their hands. Face coverings absolutely are part of that conversation. Uh, folks getting vaccinated and those who are eligible to get boosted also taking advantage of that opportunity. Those are all things that have led to California having fewer school closures than other states throughout the country, even though we have more schools than the rest of the country. One of the, uh, I think, good things to hear in, the, in Dr. Galley's presentation yesterday was that masking in schools will end as conditions improve. He was very clear on that. That is the pathway that the state is looking towards. Um, it is a question of when, not a question of if. On that question of when, uh, the state has uh, affirmed that they will come back on February 28th to reassess all of the current data. They will take not a look at just one specific piece of data, but that global view of everything that's going on. So case rates, hospitalizations, vaccination rates, national and global trends, all those different pieces go into that conversation. And on February 28th, uh, with any luck, if we continue to see really good improvements in many, many of those metrics, I think the conversation around when the face covering requirement will be adjusted uh, will be a much more lively conversation on the 28th. It was made clear in that presentation uh, that the that the uh, state is not lifting this requirement and local counties and jurisdictions can implement safety measures. I'm sorry, that once the state does lift that requirement and make it a recommendation, local counties and jurisdictions can implement safety measures that are more protective than what the state puts in place. And we have seen that in some areas of the state, San Francisco, LA, where they do have uh, measures at the county level 
that sit are, are more restrictive or have greater levels of protection than what the state is requiring. However, it was also reinforced and made very clear that local jurisdictions, including school districts, cannot implement less protective measures than what the state is requiring. So again, that goes to the conversation around whether we have that flexibility to follow the mask requirement or not. That was also part of the conversation that I'll get to next, which is the conversation and the letter that we received from the Sacramento County Department of Public Health today. Uh, this was sent out to school leaders throughout the state. It's also posted to our website. So if you go to our website and that news feed, today's item regarding masks in schools and that update to our families and to our staff, we've posted that letter at the top of that news item so everybody can see what our local health officials are sharing with our school leaders as well. Uh, there's kind of three areas that I'll, I'll highlight from that letter for you this, this evening. Uh, the first is that the, our local county health officials are reaffirming that COVID-19 continues to have a large impact on our communities. Again, when we look at that case rate in Sacramento County of 38.2, while it is a great, great improvement for where, from where we've been just recently, uh, when we look at the historical trend of the entire pandemic, it is still a high number and we still want to see that move in the right direction. Uh, but thankfully, we are seeing it move in the right direction and we hope and expect that it will continue to move in the right direction. The letter from Sacramento County Public Health also restates that indoor face coverings in schools are required. And I got to have a, a very direct and raw and real conversation with a number of very passionate parents and students today. And in many of the letters and, and conversations we do have with our families and with our staff, one of the questions we get is, where does this requirement really come from? And I don't wanna oversimplify it, uh, but the short version is, the legislature in the state health and safety code, I believe it's section 120140, says that the California Department of Public Health can put into place measures that prevent the spread of communicable diseases, which includes COVID-19. So when California Department of Public Health puts out a requirement to limit the spread of a communicable disease, it does have the force of law and we are required to follow it. The county letter today also goes on to uh, refer to a former state letter that had been published earlier in the year that really talks about if there are schools or local jurisdictions that do not follow those requirements, there are potential consequences. And it's called out that it could open up both the organization and individual employees to liability. It could have impacts for credentialed staff in school districts who could be referred to the Commission on Teacher Credentialing for disciplinary action. And it could make uh, individuals or the organization subject to fine or civil actions by local health officers. So there are impacts. It is written into our health and safety code in the state of California. It is there to help keep all of our communities safe and we are required to follow it. Uh, the other area I wanted to highlight from the letter from the uh, county officials today is that there is room to improve our vaccination rates among our youth to help protect them as well as our schools and our community. Uh, so that is something that we continue to work on with our local partners. Um, and certainly that is a, a voluntary optional thing for all of our families who choose to engage in vaccination for their students and for themselves. Uh, we continue to try and make vaccinations available for those who choose to take advantage of them. And I do want to highlight for everybody that we continue to monitor proposed legislation around the possibility of a state vaccination requirement, um, as well as whether the California Department of Public Health would put in a, a direct requirement. Uh, right now, if California Department of Public Health's proposed requirement were to go into effect, it does have the ability for families to have a personal or medical exemption. Uh, so we are closely watching that and looking for final details on that, as well as any legislation that may pass. And as soon as we have any final details, on any of those pieces, we will absolutely be communicating again with all of our staff and all of our families on those issues. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Superintendent Kern to see if there's anything else you'd like me to hit on or anything else to add. No, Trent, I appreciate that. You really covered a lot of information and I will turn it back over to Dr. McKibben. Thank you very much for, for all of that information. Uh, that Ms. Rye, do we have any public comment on this item? We do have several raised hands at this time. Okay, will you manage that please? Of course. For our first commenter is Bethany Mitchell. Please begin when you're ready and go ahead and mute yourself. Um, hi, can you hear me? 
Yes, they can. Um, so the reason I'm on here is because I, I hear everything you guys are saying about the California Department of Public Health, how your hands are tied. And I think a lot of parents are just, we're kind of tired of hearing that. Um, at some point, someone needs to help advocate for the kids. Um, there are some stuff, a lot of studies, actually, there's 47 studies that I can send you all, um, showing that cloth masks are ineffective in stopping transmission of COVID. One of these studies was actually from the CDC, which showed that 85% of the, those who con contracted COVID during July of 2020 were mask wearers, while 3.9% of the study participants never wore masks. Um, another study noted that um, although surgical masks um, do provide protection for 95% of particles, only the particles that are five microns in diameter or more, while the coronavirus is only 0 0.125 microns. Thus, the virus spreads freely between the fibers of the mass. Um, and again, I'll be emailing all these studies for you guys to see for yourselves. Um, also, the way that masks are being worn in schools is actually a health hazard because the masks are being contaminated. People are storing them in their pockets, backpacks, putting them on the table, touching them all the time. They're full of bacteria. And one study actually proves that, and I will send that study to you as well. The examples that I'm talking about now don't even touch on the suicide rates, depression, anxiety, and speech delays increases that we've seen. And it would be foolish and foolish and anti-science of me to say that masking kids in schools is definitely not the cause of any of those increases in those conditions. You know, I, I just think to myself, which side of history are we going to be on, you guys? Like, enough. Enough is enough. You guys need to try to advocate for the kids. I don't know what that looks like for you guys, but I don't feel that you are. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Katie Day. Please begin when you are ready. Hi. Yeah. I, um, I actually have a question for Mr. Allen. Um, are there uh, vaccinated students that have COVID right now? You, you were putting out those statistics. Are any of those kids vaccinated? Because, yeah, that's for, for Mr. Allen. I, I'm not understanding. I'm not understanding from the uh, California Department of Public Health why there are certain um, mask requirements for the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. If both vaccinated and unvaccinated people are getting COVID and spreading COVID. So there comes a time when you have to stop and ask yourself if any of this makes any sense. We are not seeing any of you acting like leaders or actually intelligent people. Asking why are these mandates going into, into place, these requirements going into place when they don't make any sense logically or scientifically? If you're going to continue on the party line that COVID, vac COVID vaccines are stopping the hospitalization rates, how many kids in San Juan School District are in the hospital right now, Trent? How many? How many in California? How many of those have been vaccinated? Give me the numbers that back up all of the stuff that you have just told us because it makes no logical sense. And we are going to keep coming back every time you have a meeting until all of you are gone. And thank you for your comment. Next, we have Colin Mergent. Please begin when you are ready. Hi, Ed Code 49451 says that whenever there is good reason to believe that the child is suffering from a recognized contagious or infectious disease, then he shall be sent home. There were dozens of kids kicked out of their classrooms today. Some were completely removed from school. Were they all infectious and suffering from a disease? Does the mere presence of an unmasked face indicate infection with disease? Of course not. Simply not wearing a mask is no reason to believe that they're infected and excluding them from education is not warranted. The interpretation of this ed code is being manipulated. Today, San Juan district officials made a statement to KCRA that said in part, we also feel the frustration 
and the desire to return to normal from the safety precautions. Well, finally, thank you for that admission. Roseville Joint Union High School District Board Trustee Heidi Hall spent three weeks doing the work for you. You wanna to return to normal? Email Heidi Hall, hall at rjuhsd.us. She may be willing to help you draft a resolution. And you'd better do it quick because things are starting to get worse, aren't they? Are you waiting for parents to start filing Williams Act complaint forms? If their child was unsupervised, was outside in extreme weather conditions, didn't have a Chromebook or other materials, parents can just Google Williams Act complaint forms, click the first link, fill it out and give it to the principal. Are you waiting for parents to start turning in uniform complaints procedure forms? Parents can just Google San Juan USD uniform complaints, click the first link and click uniform complaint form to fill out a complaint if their child suffered any discrimination, harassment, intimidation, or coercion on campus. Nobody wants this. You should avoid that. You said in your email to parents today that you want to support welcoming learning environments. Do you think you're doing a good job at it? What could you do differently? You cannot solve problems by doing nothing. Get a resolution going immediately to make masks optional. And thank you for your comment. Next, we have Tennille Stewart. When you are ready, please begin. I'll start with positive. Um, I think you guys are doing a good job with at least offering COVID um, testing sites and uh, in order to volunteer at my school site, I have had to use your COVID testing sites and they've been efficient and quick. So I appreciate that if that requirement is going to be in place. Um, the next thing I want to address is the fact that continued masking of our children is unacceptable. Uh, it's inconsistent with our society as whole. Uh, you guys pointed out all these numbers about how the case rates were so high in January. And yet all of our students were vaccinated or part of our students were vaccinated because that's the party line that you guys have been running with. And the case numbers were still high. These kids were all wearing masks to school. They were all testing. And yet those numbers were still so high. So if masks were an effective measure of safety, if using hand sanitizer and washing our hands and testing and being vaccinated were an effective measure of safety for kids to be able to continually access school, then why did we have all of those cases in January? So obviously what is being done and what has been done over the last two years to our students has not been correct, has not been effective and should have not been implemented. So action needs to be taken to end this continued torture of our children, this continued abuse of them having to be forced to wear a mask. If an individual or a child wants to wear a mask, that should be their choice. But on the same token, if they do not, they should not have to be forced to wear one to be able to access education safely and efficiently. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Serena Henman. Please begin when you are ready. A few hundred people gathered last week and waited nearly five hours to find out if Roseville Joint Unified School District would adopt and implement a resolution created by Heidi Hall, their own board member. Students shared the horrific stories about masking and how teachers have traumatized them through the use of these ridiculous COVID policies. Many students shared why they want mask choice, what they have endured the last two years to make them want mask choice, and how taking a stand for mass choice has caused their quality of education in school to diminish. Many students are struggling emotionally and mentally, which in turn has affected their education to the point many have given up, given in, and no longer even care to try. What we have is a pandemic of mental health in our youth. My daughter has recently been added to this group due to suffering anxiety and panic attacks. RJUSD School Board realizes the most important aspect of their position is to protect and care for our children. Nearly two years later, RJUSD is taking a stand and fighting back for our children and their student rights. RJUSD making this decision to fight has given me so much hope for our district, for you guys. Hope for our children's future and hope for their education. As a mother of three children within the San Juan School District, I am pleading with you to please consider putting the Roseville resolution on the next board meeting agenda. I sent an email to all of you of this resolution this past Friday. It's already drafted and ready to go. I am still anxiously awaiting a response. It is ultimately your decision to place an item on the agenda. We have finally found a resolution to represent all of our students 
please place this resolution on the agenda and do what is right for our children and our kids. If you won't listen to us parents, please listen to them and make a decision based on what is right for all of San Juan's community. Let's show our children what true leadership looks like and take a stand to fight for them. Show them they matter more than politics, more than money, and more than what a law firm says is a liability. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Amanda Olteen. Please begin when you are ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. As a parent in the district, I'm extremely disappointed and frustrated that now two years into this endemic, our children are still wearing masks to school. My daughter is in kindergarten and is at a critical learning stage in her education by not being able to see her teacher's face every day, which means she cannot lip read or see facial expressions. Her development in reading and writing is put at risk, not to even mention the social and emotional consequences of masking on our children. The Roseville School Board just unanimously voted to end the mask mandates within their district. This can be done at the district level and should be done. At this point in the endemic and with the plethora of data readily available, it is irresponsible to continue forcing our children to wear masks at school under the guise of safety. It is time our board takes action and advocates for our children who are the least vulnerable demographic as it relates to COVID with 67 total deaths of kids under 18 in California over the past two years and a 0.0007% mortality rate per the CDC website and end the school mandates. My husband and I are lucky enough to have the means and resources to pull our kids from public school if mandates don't end, though this is not what we'd always envision doing. We're both products of the San Juan Unified School District and have two younger kids we plan on putting through the district as well. However, in the end, we will definitely do what's best for our children's physical and mental health and safety. In closing, I have one question for the board that I know countless of other parents are wondering as well as you've heard tonight, and that is given the fact that COVID is here to stay and cases will inevitably increase again at some point, what will you do to advocate for our children to ensure they have mass choice at our schools indefinitely regardless of case rates? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Meg. Please begin when you are ready. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is Megan, and I am the mother to two students that were at Carnegie during the first Freedom Friday maskless movement that they created because you are not listening to the families in your district or the parents at all. Our kids have decided to take this matter into their own hands. And in the meantime, one of my daughters, the vice principal alerted me that she would be out with unmasked students on the public sidewalk in front of Carnegie. That is not in the school boundaries. So when I reminded him that that was absolutely ludicrous and that you would be putting our children in endangerment when we are, fun fact, the top 10 most human trafficked area in the nation, everyone. They were going to put our students out in harm's way. When he realized that, he assured me that our students would not be put out there. My second daughter decided to leave in second period and join the movement. Very brave. She was left out in translation. I was never notified. The school had no idea where my daughter was. So you guys need to get on board with your communication and I'm going to release the next 38 seconds to my daughter so you can have a real opinion by a student. Hi, my name is Tristan and I am in sixth grade. I have been protesting on Freedom Friday. Some of my other friends have done it with me. We are not anti-vaccine, not anti-mask. We are pro-freedom of choice. I have heard they are going to end the mask mandates, but they keep pushing back the time. My question is why? With all due respect, I am trying to start a movement. Kids are trying to start a movement. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Sadie Rovito. Please begin when you are ready. 
Hello, my name is Sadie and I go to Daldea Elementary School and here's my story about me not wearing a mask to school. When I walked right into class, everything was normal. Then my teacher called me and my friends over to talk to her. And someone in my class said, Sadie, your mask. And I tried to ignore them. But once again, they said, Sadie, your Matt, your mask. And I said to them, I'm not wearing one. And they stopped saying it. And another student said, stop breathing on everyone. My teacher told him to stop and then asked, how come you aren't wearing a mask? Then I said, the governor didn't wear one, so why should I? And she said, I totally agree with you and had me go back to my seat. Then four minutes later, a student goes, where's your mask? And then another student says, yeah, where is your mask? And I said, I'm not wearing one. So another student calls me a Karen for not putting a mask on. And the student next to me moved her whole desk away from me. And I felt hated. And the student next to me says, you have one more chance to put a mask on or we will tell the teacher. And I said, I'm not putting one on. So they told the teacher and the teacher was fine with me not wearing a mask, but she had me sit away from the class and my teacher called the office and I was then sent to the office and told to go home. And while I waited for my mom to pick me up, they had me sit outside in the freezing cold weather all by myself. After that, I felt totally discriminated against. And then the rest of the week, my class bullied me. Thank you for your comment, Sadie. Our next commenter is Lindy Brazier. Please begin when you are ready. Hello, my name is Corey Brazier. I am deaf and my wife is going to be signing, interpreting for me tonight. You may be hearing many comments about masks. <clears throat> I am not here to rant about that, however, I want you to think about what San Juan Unified School District can and will do to help disproportionate impacted students. Are you aware that this mask requirement is enforced in all settings, including classrooms, where students who relies on mouth as part of their mode of communication? There are teachers, speech therapists, instructional aides, and staff who cannot remove their masks to ensure that their students are getting equal communication access without the fear of facing consequences for not following the rules. While your policy may state that shields can be used in lieu of masks, many principals, teachers, and staff are not aware of it and will lash out at them for not wearing masks. I've also heard stories from students and staff that they are forced to wear masks in speech therapy sessions. How does this work when they aren't able to see the visual phonetics? This is more likely to explain why the research shows that over 350% surge in speech and language delays. If you cannot agree on removing the mask requirement, please take into consideration to revise the policy to allow and make it clear that teachers, speech therapists, and staff can remove their masks instead of training them that they cannot take the mask off to show their face. These students rely on mouth as part of their communication. It's a no-brainer thing to do. Now, my daughter would like to make a comment. Please restart the timer as she will be using her mother as a sign language interpreter. Thank you. Hi, my name is Addison Brazier. I'm hard of hearing, and I had to switch to independent study instead of in-person school because, because it is nearly impossible for me to tell what someone is saying when they <clears throat> are wearing a mask. By enforcing the mask mandate, you're completely ignoring the needs and necessary accommodations of your students. This goes completely against FAPE, free appropriate public education which promotes inclusive, appropriate education for all children, including children with disabilities. Forcing deaf and hard of hearing kids and their teachers to wear masks restrict our equal communication access and it's blatant ableism. There is now a huge disconnect between me and my peers because they're unintentionally ostracizing me due to this mask mandate. Please start making decisions that impact all of your students positively. I'm sick and tired of not being able to communicate with people. It has become a very, very lonely life. I'm considering switching to Roseville Joint Unified School District, even though they don't have a deaf and hard of hearing program, because at least there I'll have equal access. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your comments. Our next commenter is Michaela Golden. 
When you are ready, please begin. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Michaela Golden. I have three kids in three different San Juan Unified Schools, Twin Lakes Elementary, Carnegie Middle School, and Casa High School. We are a third generation family in your district. I graduated from Del Campo and my mom and her brothers from Bella Vista. When we first moved to Orangeville, I was excited to be part of San Juan Unified and we were happy until COVID hit and the lack of true leadership made itself so obvious. It is beyond ridiculous that our children are still masked. Did you not see the Super Bowl, thousands of fans and celebrities, yet no one was wearing a mask? Newscom even released the indoor mask mandate today, but somehow it doesn't apply to our schools. It is absolutely appalling and downright child abuse the way San Juan Unified has handled the COVID response to date. And it is very clear that their children in our district have been put last. From different protocols at each school site to the quarantine guidelines that do not make any common sense, to the enforcing of mass compliance, even when the evidence clearly shows how ineffective it is, to the online learning, which was a complete joke, to the lack of programs to help make up the learning loss caused by the online learning nightmare, and to the threat of a vaccine mandate that still looms over us. As a parent, I am here to tell you we are done. My kids are done. We want a board that stands up and protects our children and we do not want to hear there's nothing you can do, which is your usual answer. The Roseville Joint Union High School District passed a resolution on February 9th making masks optional as of today. Today, not two weeks from now where it will be revisited by Governor Newsom and, and the Teachers Association in the state. I ask that you draft a resolution today making masks and vaccines a personal choice. If the current board members do not want to protect our children and show true leadership, we will reelect board members that will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next commenter is Chelsea Higdon. Please begin when you are ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. There, I'm the mother of a first grade student in San Juan Unified School District, and I'm here today to urge you to end the mask mandates and allow for mask choice in our schools. I heard Trent Allen's comments on all of the reasons why we cannot, and I instead challenge you to ask why not. Take the unpopular stance and protect the students of San Juan Unified by allowing mask choice. My son and his peers as first graders have never experienced a normal day of learning, in their entire educational experience, while older students haven't experienced a normal day in nearly two years. They've been forced to submit to protocols that are implemented without consideration of the long-term impacts on children, nor their social, emotional, or mental well-being. I was told this morning by Trent Allen that enforcing masks is a protocol for the health and welfare of students. I argue that the health and welfare of students is made up of much more than just this small COVID. We are focusing on a tiny piece of the picture and ignoring all of the other impacts of masking students. We've seen astronomical increases in childhood anxiety, depression, self-harm, to what reward? Not to mention the impacts of distant, distance learning and masking on educational outcomes. Could you imagine trying to learn to read while being masked, while your teacher's wearing a mask? Cloth masks have pro been proven ineffective. If masks stop transmission, then who can cares if my child doesn't wear a mask. Isn't your mask protecting you? It's been two years since our students were able to look their teachers or their peers in the face. It has been too long. It's time to provide a choice for our students. San Juan Unified needs to be a leader in doing what is best for our students, not a last seated follower. Stand up and do something. End forced masking today. I've also reached out to the offices of Governor Newsom, State Senator Dr. Pan, and the Assemblyman Ken Cooley to voice these concerns and this request. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Rosa Parks and please go ahead and begin when you are ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi, my name is Zoe Brazier. I'm an eighth grader at Carnegie, one of the students that got kicked to the curb with no supervision for two and a half hours for not wearing a mask. Being one of the biggest school districts in Sacramento, I thought you would have been a leading district and lift the mask mandates by now. Please consider following Roseville Unified School District as they are putting their students first. I know I'm not allowed in my thinking 
I'm not alone in my thinking, as many teachers have expressed their support in wanting mask choice. Please stand on the right side of history. And now my sister wants to say something. Hi, my name is Reagan, and I'm in elementary school. All I hear at my school is put your mask on, put the mask over your nose, don't suck on your mask, your mask is too loose, you need a new one. Obviously, we aren't wearing them right. Why are you pushing this mask mandate so hard? Just lift the mandate so we have more time to learn than we yelled at. I've heard all the reasons why you don't want to lift the mandate. All these reasons are just excuses. Excuses are like armpits. We all have them and they stink. Don't be an armpit. And thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Eddie Russell. Please begin when you are ready. Hi, yes, thank you, Eddie Russell. I, uh, I mistakenly drove by the district office this evening with my nine-year-old son thinking the meeting was being held in person. And when looking around the office, my son and I actually noticed several district employees maskless walking around in the office freely. This do as I say, not as I do style leadership that represents our children's school district and education is absolutely ineffective and toxic to put it lightly. Our children have endured enough during this pandemic. To the gentleman that read the updates off uh, the CDPH and the CDC website, you're talking about regulatory compliance and not safety. You're talking about possible monetary penalties and not our children's education. You're referring to public health offices and not taking a stance for our kids' mental health. And I understand that's your job and I respect that. But today, my wife and I, who are highly dedicated members of our community, have decided to allow our children a choice whether they would like to wear their masks or not. We have encouraged them to stand up for themselves and take their masks off if they want to. We've asked them that and they most certainly do. They're restrictive, uncomfortable, and they provide a false sense of security, not to mention that they, they install instill fear. Uh, as, as many previous uh, speakers have mentioned, I, I can't even begin to talk about all the studies that have shown uh, that masks alone are not an effective means of prevention. Even when worn consistently and properly, face coverings do not prevent the spread of illness. I am respectfully asking this board to show us that you care do what's right, do what's right for our children and remove this mask mandate. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Carissa Bodwin. Please begin when you are ready, Carissa. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I wanna start by saying thank you. You've propelled the biggest parental movement in history by making it clear that you think parents do not know what is best for their children. I saw a letter signed by 150 educational board members from around California to ask the state to remove the COVID vaccine mandate and mask mandates for the children. Not a single board member from San Juan Unified signed. Neighboring district board members that signed included Roseville and Folsom Cordova. It is well documented that masking children leads to developmental delays, depression, and social issues. In each of your bios for your San Juan Unified positions, you mentioned being mental health advocates for children. A true mental health advocate would vote on a resolution to immediately unmask the children. None of you are mental health advocates for children. Advocates for children are removing masks, as Roseville voted on to bravely do and defy California. You are masking healthy children all day, and it is abusive. We, if we were following the science, children would have been the first group to have their masks removed, but instead they are last. You have not only awakened hundreds of parents with your overreach, you have also lost the love, respect, and trust of children in the San Juan schools. They will remember these years of being masked for 35 hours a week, and they will know exactly what atrocities the California school system is capable of. Again, I want to say sincerely thank you. The two years of absurd and cruel treatment of our children, destroying their education and undermining parental consent, my eyes are now wide open and my kids will never step foot in a San Juan school. Homeschool is a subject that every single parent has discussed. We will vote your weak leadership out and our children deserve better. And do not forget that mom and dad know best. Power to the parents. Thank you for your comment. 
Our next commenter is Carly Krebs. Please begin when you're ready, Carly. Carly, you're still on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Masks work. Thank you for protecting my children during this pandemic. My children don't mind protecting their community and themselves by wearing a mask inside. They haven't even been sick with a cold or flu or COVID in the last two years. And one of my children has a chronic lung condition and a minor cold can land us in the hospital. I have never seen so many parents so strongly trying to endanger our kids. Thank you board for following health mandates. And I believe that the long-term trauma on our kids will be greater for those children whose parents fight so hard to put them in danger than the trauma from wearing a mask. Thank you for your comment, Carly. Our next commenter is Amy Saygraves. Please Can you hear me okay? Ready. Yes. I'm ready. Um, I would like to um, commend the previous speaker um, that her child is using that mask correctly. I do believe that the way medical professionals use masks by never touching them and constantly changing them, only using them for a few minutes at a time, that masks can be very effective. Unfortunately, that's not the reality for our children. They go to school, they put on a mask and they're stuck in that mask. Some of them chew on it depending upon their age. They are not sanitary when they're not used by properly trained medical professionals. I understand the abundance of caution that we all came into this with two years ago. At the time, there wasn't much science to drive us in the direction of what we should do. However, now we are two years into this. There is an abundance of medical science showing that our children are at the least statistical risk for this disease and that almost every other disease throughout history has probably statistically presented a larger threat to them. Now that we have a lot of data and a lot of science driving our decisions and we have so many other precedents that show that school districts can choose to advocate for children, I really would champion this board to make a brave decision, not a politically safe position, not something that continues your career with um, the liberal folk in California, but please think about the kids. Think about the mental health aspects. In an abundance of caution, think about mental health. You don't know the long-term side effects of constantly covering their faces. In an abundance of caution, think about their social inter interactions and what this is doing to them as um, our future. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. And Dr. McKibben, that is 30 minutes and per board bylaw, we would need board action to continue public comment at this time. Dr. McKibben, you are on mute, sir. Okay, now I'm am I off? Okay, um, we will be moving. Uh, we will be moving on to uh, 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 the board members. Uh, 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 Ms. Viasquez, uh, will you begin, please? Thank you, President McKibben, and um, thank you as well to everybody who who called in today and joined us both at the front of the meeting and during this important topic. Um, thank you as well to Trent who continues to moonlight as our in-house public health expert inadvertently. Um, I know we've all taken on a lot of new roles and responsibilities during this difficult time. Um, I just want to um, acknowledge the frustration of the prolonged pandemic and, and the masking requirements. I understand people are angry and need somewhere to um, be angry. And um, I know we're all ready to move on. We absolutely must keep schools open and safe for all of our kids, for our communities and our staff and teachers. Classrooms are full of children in close quarters, many of whom are not yet eligible to be vaccinated or are not vaccinated. And we have numerous kids 
teachers, and staff that are vulnerable. As Mr. Allen covered, during January of this year, at one point we had 6,000 schools across the country closed, but that was not the case here in San Juan or largely in California because we have a universal mask mandate in schools. Prematurely removing masks in classrooms puts our kids, teachers, and parents at risk. I know many people are ready to move on, but it's not done just because we declare it done and, and we're tired of it. <clears throat> I support continuing to follow the guidance of our state and local public health leaders. I am proud to stand up for public health and to protect our children. We're nearly there. I look forward to the February 28th updates that um, have been indicated are forthcoming by Secretary Galley. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. Uh, I want my colleagues to know that I respect and welcome your opinions very much, but I'd like to comment on this uh, item. I am of the opinion that we as a district need to send a message to our county and state officials that we end the mandate that are currently in place and not wait until the revaluation date of February 28th by the state. By doing so, we join other districts in our state, other states in our country, and other countries in our world that have decided to forego on the mandates. We would leave it to our parents who are in the best position to make decisions about their children's health to determine whether their children should be vaccinated or to require a mask, as, as, as I have said publicly many times, we could never eliminate risk. We can only try to mitigate risk to the best of our ability. But as we've seen with this current variant, the vaccines cannot prevent transmission and districts with mask requirements have not proven more effective at preventing infections than districts in other states without mask requirements. Mandating vaccines and masks won't stop transmission and going full forward with them despite this reality will hurt our credibility with our parents, our students and employees of our district. With their permission, may I read a portion of emails I received today from teachers in our district. Quote, as you see today, parents are upset and rightfully so. Do what is right and give students and teachers the choice in wearing a mask. Stop forcing wearing masks when no one else has to, end quote. Second quote, never in my years as an educator did I expect to ever have to continue to support a cause for which I do not agree. I support freedom of choice and access to an education. Students should not be expected to mask up to receive an education, end quote. In closing, I realize that there are studies on whatever side you stand, however, it is clear to me that parents want the right to choose for their children, and I think we should support and stand with them with the right to do so. Thank you. Ms. Costa. I hear the anger, I hear the frustration, but I also believe that we were elected to uphold laws and there is at this time a law that is requiring us to have students and staff wear masks. On the 28th, we'll reassess, but until that time, I feel like we need to go forward with what has been already presented. Ms. Creason. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. I have a series of comments, but I wanna go back to the question of public comment. Are we gonna take that up as a board or either vote it down or vote it, vote it or approve it to continue public comment? Or is that your unilateral decision? Uh, when we're when we're through uh, board comment, uh, if you if you want to bring up a proposal uh, and and get a second, we'll vote on it. Okay. Okay. If that's the case, then can we have the opportunity to make further comment after public comment if we have something in response? If that's what you want. Okay. Um, I'm going to be as succinct as I can throughout comment. I've been writing notes and it's all over the place, so I'm going to do the best that I can. Um, first, I just have a question for staff about our policy about um, shields versus masks. 
I want to make sure I understand that correctly. Do we allow shields where a fa full face can be seen um, if that's the preference of the teacher or student? In those cases where it is necessary for a learning uh, purpose, uh, use of a shield uh, is allowable. Uh, shields are encouraged to have drapes on them as well, but a shield or a face mask with a clear patch rather than a solid uh, covering is also allowable. Okay. Um, the, to the family that um, brought up that issue with their kid that is receiving special services, um, I just would, it, it's hard, we can't dialogue with you in public comment, but I'd like to encourage you to reach out. Um, in an email or maybe make a phone call um, to staff so we can get your needs met because I hear what you're saying and it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I just want to make sure your needs are being met and your questions are answered. Um, I, during public comment, there was a lot of comments that um, assumed a whole lot about the board's perspective and what they're bringing to the table. So there's a couple of things about myself I just want to clarify. Um, Number one, I have regarding mental health, I was the president and CEO of Mental Health America of California for many years. I um, worked for Mental Health America for a very, very long time, decades. I have two siblings that died by suicide. I do consider myself a mental health expert. I don't know everything, but I know a lot. And I agree that our kids, including my own, that's another um, assumption I want to address is I do have a kid attending a district school. Every decision that's been made on this dais or vote that I've made on this dais hasn't just been done to others, it's been done to my family too. And I take it um, very, very seriously, what's happening in my home as well as yours. And I know that my son has definitely had some struggles. His friends have had struggles. Our community has had struggles, the kids and the adults. I'm trying to get through this pandemic. This pandemic has been hard on everybody, including myself. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge, you know, and just kind of clear up, I wanted to be able to state my truth because I feel like there's been a lot of assumptions of who I am and I'm happy to have a conversation. You know, again, it, you, we can't dialogue on a, in a board meeting. And of course, glad that you come and make your public comment, but if you wanna have a conversation, I'm always, able, always happy to do that, to talk more about who I am and where I'm coming from in my rationale. Um, I too wanna to acknowledge frustration. Um, it was really hard watching Super Bowl, you know, and watching all these maskless faces and seeing the governor's picture and, it is very frustrating. Um, I think my take on it though is a little different. It isn't, oh, well, if they can do it, then we shouldn't need to do it either. It's what are you guys doing? Um, so I think my my takeaway from that is different, but it upset me too. I think where I, I landed in my thinking is just a little different. And so I'm gonna make a few comments and it's not my intent to change anybody's mind here, but I do feel that I want to explain some of my rationale um, and address some of the comments that were made. Um, you know, in my opinion, leadership, part of leadership is knowing where your expertise lie and where they don't. And I have said over and over and over and over again on this dais throughout this pandemic, I am not a doctor. I am not a scientist. My qualifications lie elsewhere. And I am not comfortable making medical decisions for anybody else. Um, I'm just not. I'm, I, that, that's not what I'm bringing to the table. And I do rely on county and state guidance to let us know, you know, by the actual doctors and scientists, um, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't. So when I hear get rid of your mandate, it, it's not our mandate. We never voted to put this in. Um, this is a law that we have to follow. And that's part of, in my perspective, that's part of our oath of office. Um, and I hear the, I hear your rationale too. That I, I do seek to understand, do I agree with everything I heard tonight? No. And you're not going to agree with everything I'm about to say, but I, I, Every time I hear people talk and I learn more about your rationale, I learn something. And I do appreciate the time that you take to do that. So I hear you when you say, well, Roseville, Roseville had the, um, you know, did their resolution and they're going to get rid of the mandate. Well, it's not their mandate to get rid of. And they're in a completely different county with, and I don't know their rules. I think they're in Placer County and I don't know what their health department has put out. I don't know if it's aligns with that county or not. All I know is what we are required to do based on our county's rules. And it's very clear, the memo that I, I think I heard staff say it's posted on the website now that um, we have to do it. And so I'm not comfortable, again, you know, when the health professionals say we have to do X and they mean that X, me as a politician, you know, and a businesswoman and a mom, 
saying, oh no, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so I'll leave that one there. You know, when we went into distance learning um, and then hybrid, all of us really just wanted campuses to be open. And I do believe that, you know, the measures that we put, well, it's true, the measures we put in place, you know, the, there were mandates and there were rules. We had to do X, Y, Z to be able to open campuses. And so that's what we did because we wanted campuses to be open. And I still stand by that. We have to keep campuses open. And there's a whole lot that can come down on us if we choose to ignore the rules. And, and I don't know what that'll look like when it comes down to closing campuses. Um, again, I'm all over the place because I was writing notes as everyone talked um, very attentively. You know, something that I don't feel came up enough in this conversation is our workforce. Um, I get it. There's all these numbers related to kids. And of course, kids come first. But without our workforce, there is no school. And we have adults in the room, too. And we have to keep them safe as well. Um, if we don't have, I mean, we already are facing significant shortages in workforce. And then you add, you know, when we're having the surges, then we lose a whole lot more <laughs> of our workforce. I mean, there was some really touch and go times when we came back. I know someone brought up um, January, you know, the case rates were so high. Well, that was because we were on vacation. You know, that was right after Christmas break where these mitigations weren't in place. We weren't on our campuses and the rates were really high. And now that we've been back for a while, it's starting to get better. I hope we continue that trend. But I guess what I'm saying here is, you know, our workforce is a huge consideration in this whole pie. You know, how we make all of this work without our workforce, none of this None of this works and they're at risk as well. And it's important that we keep their health and safety um, as part of the conversation as well, because we can't do it without our workforce. I'm getting close to done, Dr. McKibben. <laughs> I, I warned you, it's all over the place and I was taking good notes. Um, and regarding advocacy, I appreciate, you know, I've spent my entire career um, on working in stakeholder empowerment and advocacy and state policy. And I appreciate advocacy a lot, um, whether we agree on or not. And again, I learn so much when I hear folks with different rationales. And so I appreciate that. However, it did come to my attention that today there were individuals advocating in a way that was absolutely inappropriate within district office, like literally screaming in staff's faces. And I just want to humanize. I mean, I understand this is a system and I'm a mom. So I get it when you're messing with my kids or I feel like you're messing with my kids or my kids are being hurt. I mean, mama bear is going to come out. And so I, I get that piece of it. These are folks working. They're at, they're at work. And so of course advocate, but coming into their workplace and screaming at them is next level. And I really hope that we can model better behavior for our kids. Um, how do we act when things are really, really hard. That's what matters most. That's something I share with my son all the time. It's easy to act right when things are easy. It's much harder when things are really hard. Um, so I do want to just state, you know, number one, in support of our staff, I'm sorry you went through that. I mean, that's a really scary thing to go through at your place of business. Um, and so I appreciate you, all that you do. And I just encourage us to, you know, yeah, be passionate. I mean, this is a passionate issue, but if we can, not scream at our staff, you know, in their workplace and, you know, really advocate in an appropriate way, that would be great. So let me just be having to summarize by just saying, you know, I, I'm super frustrated and I wish that the mask mandate would go away too, but I, again, I'm not a health professional and I do rely on those expertise. And so as long as the health professionals are saying we need to do X, I'm going to support doing X. Um, and also want to reiterate that we got to take care of our staff too to make sure that we can keep campuses open. It's not just the kids um, that are susceptible, it's our staff too. And I think that's enough for me. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. Okay, and I will try to try to be as brief as I can. Um, I believe that students are safer in schools than they are, uh, frankly, in their homes. And I believe that what Ms. Creason said related to if you look at the numbers right after they were home for several weeks was when our, our rates went up. So I, I continue to believe that, that what we're doing in schools is the right thing to keep our students safe. As Ms. Creason also said, we all took an oath to obey the laws of the state of California. As, an old, as a so, former social study teacher, I feel that indeed my obligation 
is to follow the oaths that I take, and I will do that. And finally, the personal side of this. My son has had COVID. My cousin has died from COVID. My sister-in-law had COVID, and, and, uh, but a relatively mild thing. So to suggest that this thing isn't real and we shouldn't be paying attention to it and we need to take care of our kids is not a place that I will go. I believe that's probably enough from me. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Creason, you, uh, uh, unless there, would you like to go uh, for another round now or would you like to, uh, to have a vote on whether we should continue uh, public comment? Ms. Creason, what, what is your pleasure? Um, if it's appropriate, I would like to make a motion to continue public comment, um, to extend public comment, to get through the rest of the hands that are raised. Okay. That's kind of a sloppy motion. <laughs> okay, uh, is there a second? A second. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, well, we'll do it as, as a voice vote. And, and if there's a division, th then we'll do it uh, by a roll call. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I'm sorry, I, I did not, uh, was not able to count those. All right, we'll start with, uh, this will be a, a roll call vote and Ms. Uh, Ms. Vasquez, you're first. Aye. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Hernandez. Aye. Uh, Ms. Costa. Aye. Uh, Ms. Creason. Aye. Okay, it, it is for, for another. And I will vote uh, vote aye. Also, uh, we we will. Uh, uh, Miss Rye, do we have any further people? It is nine forty right now. Uh, do we have any uh, uh, that by our bylaws we're extending it by another thirty minutes? Uh, Miss Rye, do we have any other people signed up? Yes, we we do have several raised hands. Okay, Miss um, Miss like Rye, to, yes. if you can clarify. Um, those people that have already spoke on this item, if you can clarify that piece, that yes. would be important. Yes, of course. Uh, we are limited to uh, one comment per agenda item per person. So if you have already commented on our COVID-19 update on I-4, um, please go ahead and lower your hand and we will go ahead and move down the list for folks that have not yet commented on this agenda item. So we will begin with Liz Jorgensen. Liz, please go ahead and begin when you are ready. Hi, thank you for taking my comments today. California is one of the lowest ranked in the nation, 33rd for youth mental health. We rank 27th in the nation for youth substance abuse in the last year and 45th in the nation for accessibility to mental health services in 2021. We're 44th in the nation for emotional disturbances with IEP. And I just wanted to raise the question for people to think about, what is the common denominator here? It's masking and COVID-19 mandates. As you have heard, two of our neighboring districts, Roseville Joint Union Districts, and excuse me, Union Mine High School in El Dorado Union High School District granted mask choice today after our elected officials and others flaunted in our faces the spectacle of no masks during Sunday's game. If it is good enough for our leaders, it is good enough for us. A choice for masking is in the hands of each of us. Please advocate for our children and advocate to or for your, for your constituents and give our children a choice for masking. Thank you for taking my comment. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Kendall J. And hold on a second, Kendall. I am making sure we are able to get you to speak. Please Hi, go ahead and begin. Me? Yes. Hi, my name is Kendall Johnson. I go to Castle Royal High School. I did not want to go to three uh, school for three weeks due to my mental health. Um, I believe that wearing a mask, not only being able to see only half of my peers' face throughout my day is affecting me. Um, I'm a student when witness, witnessing it firsthand. This is creating a mental health issue in our youth. Education is what you guys are saying that you care so much about. When I am being held from outside of my classes, refusing to 
um, wear a mask within my classes and being told that I am not allowed to take tests unless I am in the classroom. This is my right as a student. This is my right as an American citizen to not wear a mask. Today, I was at the protest and as I was inside the office observing, there was several San Juan Unified School District staff members that were not wearing a mask. And there was actually a couple that were right outside of, I believe it was an office that were wearing their mask. And then as they walked back in the back office, they took it off. I witnessed that with my own two eyes. I have a video that I am willing to email you guys. And um, this is unacceptable. I am not anti-vax. I am anti-mandate. I believe it is my choice as an American citizen to wear a mask or not. And that is all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your comment, Kendall. Next, we have Christina Shirk. Please go ahead and begin when you are ready, Christina. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Thank you we so much. You. Um, I kind of like how Zima broke it down and I just wanted to kind of respond a little bit. My son is Caden, probably saw him. Um, his video went viral on Andrew Carnegie's middle school being kicked to the curb because the staffing was untrained and un did not know how to handle a protest with children going out there. Um, and so I, I have a lot more feelings um, amongst this, but I wanna go back to Pam Costa, you mentioned, and Michael McKibben about upholding county and state mandates. Let's not forget that state mandates allowed us to have a Super Bowl. And to get into the SoFi Stadium, there was no proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test. Um, they allowed that to proceed because it's about the money. Let's not forget that. It's about the money. Um, and so while you think that you're upholding state mandates, let's just remember they're putting the burden of our children to carry this pandemic further, to further push their agendas. Um, if it really was a state mandate and a health crisis, they would have not allowed the Super Bowl to be held here in California. Workforce, um, Zima, you brought up, we're not mentioning enough. Um, the amount of praise my child got for what he did and how he stood up was incredible. Teachers had classrooms clapping for him. There was teachers walking by with signs saying, I am so proud and crying, but they cannot stand up because they are afraid to get backlash and be fired um, or having backlash from their uh, employees, co-employees, their coworkers. So the workforce is behind these students. They are so proud of them. Um, and as far as advocating and screaming, did you know that you had a janitor at Andrew Carnegie at the second um, Friday screaming at the kids, yelling at the kids, telling them you just need to put it on. You're not, you're not protesting correctly. There's video of kids having that. So there's a lot more going on with the boots on the ground. Um, I know I only have two minutes, but um, there's a lot going on. And uh, I really think you need to dig deeper and not just say, well, this is my job to follow the law. You need to push and fight for these kids. That's your job. Thank you for your comment. And our next commenter is Matthew Saygrave. Matthew, when you are ready. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So you had a couple of board members, I believe three of them state that um, they couldn't go against California law. California law is established by the Senate and the assembly and is signed by the governor. These are mandates that have been um, put in place by the health department. The health department is a board members that have been appointed by politicians. They are outside of our ability to remove them from office if we do not like uh, what they are doing. It is a, an appointed position. So the fact that you hold on to this thing of, we have to uphold the law. It is not a law, it is a mandate from a board that is appointed by the governor. That is all. Thank you for your comment, Matthew. And our final commenter is Lisa. Lisa, please begin when you are ready. Hi, I I'm sitting here in disbelief. This is my first board meeting. I have been to many other board meetings and I, I cannot believe what I'm hearing. Um, my daughter is the one who spoke Kendall. Actually, she, I, she is the one who's been protesting at school. She's the one who chose to take her mask off. I, I cannot 
I cannot believe how detached you people are from reality. Do you go spend time with the students there? there? Do you talk to them? Do you see their eyes pointed down, the morale is down, and the mental health worker that you have on your board? I, I cannot believe what I just heard. I also work in the mental health field. I am shocked. I am thoroughly shocked, emotionally amped. Yes, I am. When I have a daughter calling me from the bathroom, when I tell me, mom, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Mom, Grace, just keep going. Kendall, just keep going. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. I was one of those parents that stood behind my daughter and was like, "Hun, this is going to end. This is going to end. And it hasn't ended. And these are not laws. And I'm tired of the lies. I'm tired of the excuses. I'm tired of it. The suicide rates, the mental health has gone up and you people are denying it. You're denying it. You are lying. And it is hard to be a parent and to continue to advocate for your child's education. And you people do not care. I am shocked. I am so shocked at this board meeting and what you people are saying and how you don't even care about our children. Don't tell me that they are safer at school than they are in my own home. I have raised her. I have born her. You don't, how dare you people? You should be disgusted in yourself because I am disgusted in this board and I hope you lose, every one of you lose your position. I will make sure of it. Mm, thank you for your comment. Um, okay. President McKibben, that is our last raised hand. As I said, uh, we would have another round uh, of four board members, and we will begin with uh, Ms. Fiascas. I don't have anything further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hernandez. Oh, I said what I, how I feel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Costa. No further comments. Okay. Ms. Creason. Nothing to add. Ms. Creason. Oh, did my unmute didn't work? I'm sorry. I have nothing to add. Okay. And and nor nor do I. Okay, we are finished with this item. Uh, thank you uh, for the update. Thank you for all who participated in, in and made comments and so forth. Um, that we'll move on now to the recommendation for particular ki kinds of services uh, for uh, TK through 12 certificated employees, Mr. Oropalo. Good evening, President McKibben, board members, Superintendent Kerr, Ms. Myers. We are here tonight to, to present the superintendent's recommendation that the governing board discuss resolution number 3099, reducing or discontinuing with particular kinds of services and the corresponding amount of certificated staffing that will be reduced as a result, and resolution 4000, establishing criteria to break a tie in seniority for K-12, K TK through 12 certificated staff affected by the program reductions and who have had the same date of hire. This is a discussion item with action anticipated on March 8th. And I'm joined tonight by Deanne Carlson, Director of Human Resources. We can answer any questions that you have. Again, this is a discussion item. Ms. Rye, do we have any public comments on this item? We do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Uh, uh, board members, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, do we have any questions from uh, or comments from board members? Hearing Dr. McKibben, I think you should probably go in order just in case. Just in case, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Viasquez. Yeah, thank you for um, Mr. Oropal for bringing this forward. And I'm just wondering, um, can you or Mr. Kern just explain a little bit more about where we are in kind of the process? This is the beginning of an ongoing process and the likelihood of kind of um, ultimately achieving the number identified in the resolution of about 126 potential. So again, these are positions, not actual uh, people. Um, that, that's determined by a number of different pieces. Um, that would be determined by our retirements, our, our temporary positions, the, those positions that are open uh, that have not been filled this year. Um, so the number will be significantly less than, it, than before. For example, last year, I think that when we brought this resolution forward, I think we had somewhere around 50 FTE. I think we ended up with one FTE of layoff. Uh, Ms. Fiasquez, I would like to add a little bit to that though. Last year, we did keep our staffing 
um, static and did not draw it down. Um, we committed to using some of the one-time funds to provide additional staffing, whether or not students chose to stay in person or go to another option. So we were overstaffed this year by approximately 35 to 38 teachers. Next year, we are projecting declining enrollment. Um, so that would be a reduction of another approximately 25 teachers. So in our staffing component, which we do every year, we rebalance based on those projections. We, we are expecting a reduction in our budget of approximately 60 FTE. Ms. Viasquez, do you wanna follow up? Uh, I just appreciate kind of the, the, the clarification, but also, I mean, I know, you know, and I've had this conversation with you, Superintendent Kern, it can be a little bit difficult to, to reconcile like the actual positions versus the people. Like it's hard to hear um, we're overstaffed by X amount when we know we have a shortage, et cetera. And so there's just, it, those are, are all kind of different things and it, it's very complicated. So I just appreciate the opportunity to offer a little bit of clarification. Like there's the number of positions that we might have, and then there's the people that fill them and those are distinct and, and different. And I just think um, overall moving forward, um, you know, we obviously are obligated to budget out based on um, multi-year projections in a state where um, budgeting is very volatile right now. So um, it's, I just wanna take the opportunity to express that I hope we're able to um, maintain high staffing levels and recognition of the need for um, in our community and for our kids moving forward in terms of pandemic recovery and, and moving on. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Hernandez. No comment, thank you. Ms. Costa. I don't have any questions, thank you. Ms. Creason. Questions, thank you. Okay, and nor do I. Uh, this will come back to the, to the board on uh, March 8th for action. Um, uh, Mr. Opalo, would you like to go into number six related to PKS for early childhood education? Thank you, Dr. McKibben and board member Superintendent Kermis Meyer. I'm here to present the superintendent's recommendation that the governing board adopt and discuss tonight, excuse me, not adopt, but discuss resolution 4001, reducing or discontinuing in particular kinds of services and corresponding amount of certificated staffing that will be reduced and 4002, which is establishing the, the tie breaking criteria for the early childhood education staff. Again, this is an action item on March 8th. And again, I am joined by Ms. Carlson who, and who can answer any questions along with myself. And Ms. Rye, are there any public comments? We do not have any public comments at this time. Okay, and we'll go through the board on this one also, starting with Ms. Viasquez. No questions or comments, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hernandez. None, thank you. Uh, Ms. Costa. None, thank you. Uh, Ms. Creason. None, thank you. And nor do I. Okay, Mr. Opalo, uh, the uh, particular kinds of services for adult education. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. I'm, I'm here tonight to present the superintendent's recommendation that we discuss resolution 4003, which again is the uh, reduction of particular kinds of services as well as, well as a tie breaking criteria and resolution 4004 for the adult education certificated staff. Again, this is a, a action item on the 3rd of, or excuse me, on the 8th of March. Uh, is a discussion item for tonight. And again, I'm joined by Ms. Carlson. Um, if, if you have any questions. Okay, Ms. Rye, public comment? We do not have any raised hands at this time, President. Okay, are, uh, if there, are there any board members that want to comment on this one? Hearing no comment, uh, uh, this action will come back for action on March 8th. We move on to uh, item uh, I-8, uh, notice, notice of intent to reduce classified positions. Again, uh, Mr. Oropalo. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. Um, good evening, and I'd like to present the superintendent's recommendation that the governing board discuss resolution 4005, reducing or eliminating certain classified positions effective on June 30th, 2022, due to lack of work and or lack of funds, this is an anticipated action item on March 8th. And again, I'm joined by uh, Ms. Carlson, as well as uh, Diana Marshall, our program manager for human res uh, resources. We can answer any questions that you may have. Okay, 
Ms. Rai, do we have any questions related to classified uh, uh, positions? We do not have any raised hands okay. at this time. All right, I'll, since this is classified and it's a bit different, we'll go ahead and, and go through the uh, uh, each of the board members. Ms. Fiasquez. No comment or questions. Okay, uh, Mr. Hernandez. And thank you. Okay, Ms. Ms. Costa. No, thank you. And Ms. Greeson. Right. There you are. You're on. You're on now. Okay. And uh, and I have no questions. As Mr. O'Powell said, uh, this will come back uh, for board action on the eighth of March. I just want and Dr. McKibben. I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Carlson and uh, Ms. Marshall for all their work on this, as well as I like to th thank the superintendent himself, who takes a personal uh, interest in this particular item. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time going through this, and it is our intent to do as little uh, disruption as possible into the system and appreciate the board's leadership on this particular item. Thank you very much, Mr. Opal, and thank your staff uh, for all of the work. This is not easy stuff. This is, this is very hard. Uh, we move now to item J, which are board reports. Uh, and, and I'll go, uh, since I can't see all of you, uh, we'll go through the, uh, uh, by uh, the board, uh, by individual. Ms. Fiascas, do you have a board report? Nothing this evening, thank you. And Mr. Hernandez? None, thank you. Uh, Ms. Costa? No, thank you. And Ms. Greeson? Not tonight, thank you. Okay, and I am, I uh, to, do not have a report. Are there any uh, board members that wish to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, add a future agenda item onto our agenda. And I'm just gonna let you speak. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the, the five of us. So I hear nothing there. Um, then we'll, we'll move again to our, our uh, visitor comments on uh, our general visitor comments. Ms. Uh, Rye, are there any general visitor comments uh, uh, that uh, and people who would like to speak at this time? I'd like to uh, remind our attendees that if you'd like to make a visitor comment at this time to please go ahead and raise your hand. And President McKibben, I am not seeing any raised hands okay. at this time. Okay, uh, then therefore, uh, that being the case, then, uh, we do not need to move back into closed session. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. And thank you all that participated in this meeting.